The Washington Post newsroom delivers breaking events around the world as they happen. Unrivaled reporting from the journalists you've come to trust to get the facts fast and meet the challenges of today head on. Get the news that matters most with a special offer by visiting WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing unlocks instant access, bringing you the Post's award-winning coverage anytime, any place. because democracy dies in darkness. Former President Donald Trump is scheduled to make his first federal court appearance this afternoon in Miami after being charged related to his handling of classified and highly sensitive documents. Welcome to this special report from the newsroom of The Washington Post. Trump will soon, soon turn himself in to a federal courthouse. Uh, this is an unprecedented moment in American history, and we are here to guide you through it. I'm joined now by Rhonda Colvin who is our senior political correspondent, and James Homan, also with us for the rest of the afternoon, opinions columnist. Rhonda, let's just talk through what we're going to be seeing today, because right now, Trump is at Doral, uh, his, his golf course, the resort that he's come down to in Miami, and we will soon see him make this journey over to the federal courthouse. Yeah, and this seems reminiscent to what we witnessed, you know, months ago when the same thing played out back in New York City uh, for the charges that he has there. But this is incredibly significant. These are federal charges. There is history here. We have never seen a former president charged with uh, in a federal indictment. So this, this is a pretty big deal. And I know a lot of people are familiar with some of the other cases, E. Jean Carroll. We're also expecting uh, charges at some point this summer in Georgia related to the 2020 election. But th this is a moment to really take in. Even if you look at the indictment, the title of this case is the United States of America versus Donald J. Trump. And if you just let that soak in a little bit, he's running for president. He's running to be president again of this country and yet now has to go to this courthouse, turn himself in, and face these federal charges. So this is a pretty significant day. James, um, dig into the charges for us and why this is so serious. It's a lot of charges. This is uh, not the Presidential Records Act, which is what people have been focused on. He's charged under the Espionage Act uh, with possessing information that doesn't mean he's accused of espionage, but uh, highly classified, highly sensitive material uh, in his possession that he talked about uh, with various people, but the, the most potentially criminally perilous charges that the former president faces stem from alleged obstruction of justice, which is that the Justice Department, the National Archives, the FBI, they come in, they say, we have reason to believe you have these documents. And according to the indictment, Trump actively maneuvered with aides in uh, what's allegedly a conspiracy with his personal assistant, Walt Nada, uh, and even told his lawyers uh, maybe we could just make the documents go away. Would it be better if there are no documents at all? Uh, and this is the, the first time a former president has been charged with a federal crime. We thought it might happen after Watergate. That didn't happen because Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon. Uh, but here is a, a former president who's about to be tried before a judge who he nominated to the bench, mm -hmm. uh, and that, that has never happened. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's, it's fascinating to hear it put in that context, James. I just want to show you those are live images outside of the courthouse, and we will be going there in just a little while to get a sense of the scene and what's happening. And, uh, you know, this is one of those moments where we're watching the movement, we're really watching the movement of Donald Trump from one part of Miami to another. Let's talk through, Rondo, what we will be able to see today and what will be hidden from our view and the view of the cameras and photographers, but will still be happening. Well, we're not going to be able to see much. Again, this is what differs uh, to the, the Manhattan case when we followed that. You're not going to be able to see him uh, talking to the judge. Uh, I know last time we were able to get some of those photographs from inside the courtroom, but because these are federal charges and in front of a federal judge, we're not going to have that same type of access. Uh, we may be able to hear from his legal team after this is all over today. We don't know if they'll come to the 
microphones. Uh, and we also know that Trump is expected uh, to go uh, back to Bedminster, New Jersey, his home there, and, and give a, a somewhat of a, a post-indictment speech. Uh, but access this and, time and around. And fundraiser, and have a fundraiser, too. That's right. $100,000 ahead dinner. Yeah, yeah. That, and that's another important point out of all of this, is that he has been able to fundraise off of this, also the earlier indictment back in Manhattan, uh, and that has not slowed down. Um, so that, of course, is a big part of this whole story, that he is facing these federal charges at the same time as a 2024 presidential campaign. So, so it's incredibly um, just a stunning time to watch. Yeah, you know, a lot of times Donald Trump is the master. He was the apprentice at creating drama, at creating suspense in television. We don't know uh, to what extent he's going to try today to turn today into a circus. Uh, you know, we we know that Trump could come in through a side entrance, a back entrance, where he wouldn't be seen. We know there will be no cameras in the courthouse, as you were just saying, uh, unlike in Manhattan, where the, some of the hallways you could bring cameras in, have reporters in. There will be uh, reporters in the courtroom, uh, so we will get a sense of the scene on the inside. Uh, but this is, uh, it's, it's a much more secure facility than the, that Manhattan courthouse where we uh, watched Trump appear in the, the other unrelated matter a few months ago. We have the indictment here, and that was uh, unsealed, made public on Friday. And then we saw Jack Smith, who's the special counsel investigating this, in charge of that, uh, this whole process, come and speak very briefly uh, to the microphones. James, let's dig in a little bit into the indictment and, and why it stands out and comes with some, some jail time, potentially, if Trump serious, is convicted. Potentially mm -hmm. serious jail mm -hmm. time. Uh, and, and indeed, you know, there's a case in this same courthouse with someone who was charged with possession of much less classified material than what the former president had. He was just sentenced to three years in prison after fully cooperating, after admitting wrongdoing. Uh, the, Jack Smith said in his brief remarks on Friday that people should read the charges for themselves. Uh, and one of the things that makes this charging document so unique is that uh, there are photos and there are tapes. Uh, you know, we don't have the audio, but we see the video, the pictures, uh, and the pictures show uh, boxes of highly classified material in a bathroom, on the stage, in a ballroom, uh, in a storage room where there's a big photocopier that, uh, you know, literally a, a door from the pool uh, would let people go right into, often left unlocked. Uh, all the members of Mar-a-Lago could, could access these. And then we also learned about two different conversations that Trump had that are on tape where he said, allegedly, these are highly classified documents. I'm not allowed to talk to you about them or show them to you, but I'm going to do it anyway. And also, we have the contemporaneous notes of his own current lawyer, Evan Corcoran, who's pulled out of this case, uh, who, where Trump said, uh, would it be better if there were no documents? Maybe we can just say that there are no documents. Uh, that it, these were notes that Evan Corcoran typed in on his iPhone, uh, and the, the Justice Department was able to get them because a judge here in D.C., Beryl Howell, said that it, uh, attorney client privilege didn't apply because they were potentially committing a crime of obstruction of justice. So the government able to get the lawyer's private notes, which and normally you which you normally would never be able to see, about, attorney you know, client privilege, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and some of Evan Corcoran's notes were protected. The judge said these are off limits, but these uh, pierce the crime fraud exception to attorney crime privilege. So those notes are in, the notes from Evan Corcoran are in the charging document. Incredibly unusual. Uh, you know, one of the other things that's in there is quotes from Donald Trump in 2016 and afterwards talking about how important it is to protect classified information. Uh, so really laying out in more detail than you might normally see because this is such an unusual prosecution uh, against a former president. Yeah, we were looking at some images there on the side of our conversation that are from the indictment, Rhonda. And it's really a mix of photos that investigators took, but also photos that were taken by Trump's aides and people who were sort of trying to figure out what to do with the boxes. And we do get a sense of, uh, of, of, of their attitude and how they were talking about or referring to the boxes and all this classified information in the indictment. And you also see that the indictment is trying to lay out that this was all under Trump's direction, which is a key point because you're hearing a lot of Republicans uh, and Trump himself say that, well, what about Biden? What about Pence? What about Hillary Clinton? 
But from what legal scholars have been looking at when comparing all of those cases is the idea of intent, the idea of obstruction. That had Trump, when asked, when subpoenaed uh, to give up these documents and give them back, we may not be sitting here today. It would have been a case closed. But the fact that they now have details, they have text messages, they have recordings showing that Trump knew and was very aware uh, of the boxes, of what was inside the boxes, and having them moved around, uh, and aides testifying to this, uh, that makes this somewhat of a very strong case and very different from some of the other issues we've seen with classified documents. And some of the photos uh, were texted by Walt Nada, who's also charged part of the conspiracy, uh, former military aide in the White House, left the U.S. Navy when Trump left office so that he could work for him at Mar-a-Lago. Walt Nada texting an, an unnamed colleague in the Trump organization saying, all these boxes we moved into the storeroom, they tipped over last night and spilled all over the room. And he sends a photo that he took uh, to someone, you know, frankly, a coworker. And that is now being used as evidence against him. You're looking at pictures there of Walt Nada, the other individual who's charged in this. Uh, we will be watching to see how his fate is intertwined with that of his boss, Donald Trump. Uh, let's go now to Miami. Our colleague, video journalist Rich Matthews, is live outside of the Wilkie D. Ferguson Jr. U.S. courthouse. Uh, Rich, let's talk about the scene on the ground there. And I realized that you actually had to evacuate the area earlier due to a uh, suspicious item, and police have determined that it was not a threat. People have gathered again. What's the scene like now? Well, first, let me just address that incident. Someone dropped off a flat screen television that they'd made into a sign, and uh, it had, let me just say, uh, not a very nice uh, message on it uh, about the media. Um, and, uh, yeah, police took that as a threat and uh, carefully blocked off the area, uh, separated people from it, and then brought in a bomb squad to check it out. And as you mentioned, uh, it's all clear now. So what is the scene like here? I would just say, you know, uh, I, I don't really like to use news cliches, but it's a circus. Uh, you know, you have literally hundreds of media. I, I wish I were better at estimating. but. About half of this courthouse is ringed by media like us uh, here to cover this. And then in the mix, um, you know, is it hundreds of pro-Trump supporters? I don't know. It, at, at least dozens. Um, it's not thousands. Um, but those people are, you know, marching around with flags and signs. I don't know if we're looking at the live pictures right now or not. But uh, we, we can look at some live pictures. Um, and, and, you know, it has been... Uh, you know, stressful, energetic, but not chaotic and not unsafe, other than that one incident, uh, you know, that there was really, there's really not been any fear. Uh, police have tried, at least in the last uh, hour or two, to keep the opposing sides separated. They said they were only going to do that if there were issues. We've seen some, I wouldn't even really call them skirmishes, but, you know, some, uh, some pro-Trump supporters and protesters yelling at each other. Uh, to be honest, Libby, there's been a lot of yelling here, uh, a lot of marching, a lot of chanting. Uh, but again, not a, not a major organized effort on either side. Now, just quickly, I'll say that uh, we do expect former President Trump here in the courthouse in uh, about maybe maybe an hour. He's expected to leave uh, his country club, Doral, in the next 30 minutes. And uh, we don't expect him to be here long. Uh, you know, a first appearance doesn't take long, maybe 10 minutes. I think 30 minutes would be the longest. And the last note, Libby, we really don't expect to see uh, former President Trump here at all. As you've mentioned, there is an underground entrance to this that the Secret Service can drive his motorcade straight into the building, and he can be in and out uh, safely, quickly, efficiently, which is, of course, the Secret Service main concern. Libby? You know, Rich, because the media is there, of course, this is an opportunity for people who either support Trump or are against Trump, are critical of him, and are pleased with this turn of events with the indictment uh, to be seen and heard by the media. So how much do you get the sense that this is people wanting Donald Trump to know about their presence, and how much of it is them wanting to just show that, demonstrating either their support or their, uh, their sort of anti-Trump feelings? You know, again, I, I would say it is at least 10, maybe 20 to 1 Trump supporters to 
Trump protesters, maybe even more than that. Um, the overwhelming majority of people who are not media, who are here right now, are here to support President Trump. Um, I don't know the answer, and that's a great question, I, and I might ask some of the people that. I don't know the answer as to whether or not they're here to speak to us and to get their message out, or whether they're speaking, uh, you know, here to support former President Trump. But I will tell you that, again, there are a lot of red hats here, a lot of American flags, a lot of Trump flags, and, and the people are being very vocal uh, that they are not uh, in support of this, this hearing, of these charges. Um, lots of people literally yelling at the courthouse, calling this a kangaroo court. Uh, there was a picture of um, a bunch of dictators uh, on one side where they said, these are the people that lock up their opposition. So uh, again, regardless Regardless of which side uh, you are on in this situation, uh, or regardless of what you believe, I will just say that there are far more Trump supporters here speaking out than there are people opposing it. Rich Matthews, thank you so much. Stick around with us, Rich. We'll keep going to you all throughout this afternoon. James, let's reflect on that and how Donald Trump has been talking about this and uh, talking to his supporters and talking about this moment. You know, this is scary because of the January 6th overtones. I think that there's been an extra emphasis to highlight the need to stay peaceful. Uh, even, you know, Roger Stone, who Donald Trump did a radio interview with, his former aide who was involved in a lot of the planning for the Stop the Steal rallies, uh, saying make sure to be peaceful. Uh, but then you've had people like Kerry Lake, the Republican nominee for governor in Arizona who lost last year, uh, speaking in Georgia over the weekend and saying uh, we're all NRA members and they're going to have to fight their way through us before they get to him. Uh, you know, I, th I think that there is a, a hesitancy of maybe more peaceful protesters who might have ordinarily come out because of what happened on January 6th. I think there's nervousness about being part of something uh, that, that could go sideways. Also, one of the uh, protests that's being talked about for today being organized by the local chapter of the Proud Boys, mm -hmm. uh, which was, uh, of course, one of the groups that played a role uh, on January 6th and have, has subsequently faced a lot of very serious charges from the Justice Department. Uh, you, there's been a lot of monitoring of social media chatter. Uh, I think before January 6th, it was easy to dismiss a lot of that as, as idle internet uh, scaremongering. Mm -hmm. uh, and But clearly you see from the very large security presence uh, in Miami that they're taking it very seriously. The city said that they're ready for protesters from between 5,000 to 50,000. Even uh, police detectives were told to uh, come to work today in their police uniforms in case they have to deploy because something serious happens. Uh, police officers who had taken the day off were told they were no longer allowed to take today off. So there is a, a, a security posture that is very intense. And it is a consequence of what we saw on January 6th. Yeah, that's right. And if you look at what Trump has said publicly and over the last few days since the unsealing of the indictment, um, he was in front of Republicans uh, at the state party conferences in North Carolina as well as Georgia over the weekend, gave similar comments uh, where he did sort of talk about and have this rhetoric about us versus them, that if you care about your country, then fight, you know? And, and there were words that seemed very reminiscent of that speech he gave right before January 6th. So, of course, the concern in Miami or other places as well, in front of FBI field offices, too, uh, that concern seems very very warranted. Let's listen to some of what Trump had to say over the weekend. As Rhonda pointed out, he condemned the indictment during his public appearances, and he framed it as an attack, as Rhonda pointed out, on his supporters, not just on him. He re-upped his claims once again that the investigation is baseless. So let's listen to a clip from Trump's speech at the Georgia GOP convention. Either we have a deep state or we have a democracy. We're going to have one or the other. We, and we're right at the tipping point. Right now, we're way leaning toward deep state. But deep state isn't strong enough. It's really a communist country, a Marxist country. Deep state's not strong enough. Deep state now is a nice term compared to what we're doing. Either we have a failed country or we have a free and successful country. And either they win or we win. It's very simple. They win or we win. 
Donald Trump speaking over the weekend. James. This comes against the backdrop of Trump also saying on Truth Social yesterday that he is going to appoint a real special prosecutor to go after Joe Biden and people in the media uh, who are looking the other way, uh, as well as members of the Biden administration, uh, really throwing the gauntlet that there will be retaliation. Uh, and it's very uh, possible that this legal process gets dragged out until after the 2024 election so that this uh, really could be hanging over voters uh, and uh, with the, the very real possibility that Trump could become president again and either pardon himself or instruct the attorney general he nominates to drop the charges against him. Mm -hmm. Showing that timeline's mm -hmm. significance as we will be watching to see uh, how a timeline is decided upon related to these charges. Well, with us now is Aaron Blake, senior political reporter, writing for uh, The Fix as well as doing so much else. Aaron, uh, so good to see you. Let's talk about how Trump's allies are defending him since we're just coming off this uh, clip of watching how Donald Trump is talking about this. And we just heard from Rich Matthews about how supporters are acting down in Miami. Um, how are his sort of rank and file and also his higher level, uh, the known names talking about this? Yeah, so I think one thing that's important to recognize is over the last 24 hours or so, we've seen some of his 2024 opponents begin to move in the direction of saying, hey, look, you know, we don't trust the Justice Department, but maybe there's something to this. We saw Senator Tim Scott saying uh, this was a serious case with serious allegations. We saw Nikki Haley talking about how if the indictment is uh, ultimately proven to be factual, uh, that the president's actions, the former president's actions were reckless. And so I, I think what you're seeing is a recognition among Trump's opponents that, hey, it might not be fun to go after Donald Trump. Uh, it never has been if you're a Republican. We've seen that over and over again. Uh, but also recognizing that in order to defeat Donald Trump, you need Republicans to believe that there is something at least uh, at least a little bit untoward here, and you need to drive home that point. And so I think we're starting to see them at least ease a little bit into that direction while also talking about the weaponization of the Justice Department and things like that. As far as Trump's um, you know, Republican supporters in Congress, what we've really seen is an interesting argument uh, starting on Sunday, really, which is that uh, Donald Trump is being charged under the Espionage Act, but basically that he didn't go as far as to try to sell this information or give it to America's enemies or something like that. I think it's important to note that the charges here deal with the Espionage Act, but the Espionage Act is broader than that. It deals with many things that don't require a willingness to engage in espionage or assisting spies of the United States. Uh, it has been used in many uh, instances uh, of conduct that comes up well shy of espionage. And so um, I view that as, as very much kind of a political argument. They're saying this really isn't that serious, that he had documents, but look, he didn't actually like give them away to people. Um, but I think that that is also kind of a recognition of the seriousness of what's in this indictment to be making that kind of an argument, to be kind of setting the goalposts at such a serious offense against the United States and saying that he hasn't cleared that bar. Mm. Rhonda, let's talk a little more than about these charges and that sort of spin or perception of what he's facing. Yeah, you know, you're hearing on the Hill uh, two tracks. On the House side, Republicans are just have undying support uh, for the former president. Uh, Kevin McCarthy was stopped in the hallway yesterday on the Hill and asked, is it right to keep classified documents in a bathroom? And he came right back and said, is it right to have them in a garage? pointing to Biden and the classified documents found on his property. There was a lot of whataboutism among House uh, GOP members on the Senate side, as Aaron was also discussing. Uh, senators like Tim Scott, uh, Tom, uh, John Thune, who was caught in the hallway as well, um, have kind of carefully picked their words, saying these are serious charges, but people are also uh, concerned about the FBI. So you're hearing those two things, but they are carefully choosing words. What I would probably look next at, at least in the House, is attempts to take away funding from the FBI or the DOJ. That is something that has been talked about for the last few weeks, if not months, uh, since House uh, Republicans took over that chamber. They have said, you know, in an appropriations bill soon, 
we're going to cut some of the funding for the FBI because we're concerned that there was corruption in there. Uh, they're also talking about cutting funding for an FBI headquarters building. So these are, are things that you're hearing around, among House Republicans. Uh, Senate, a different story, but it was exactly the same back during the Manhattan case where both uh, House Republicans and House uh, or Senate Republicans really, they didn't match their rhetoric, but it was it was somewhat supportive, if not overly supportive, of Donald Trump on the Hill. What can Congress actually do, especially when it comes to special counsel Jack Smith, James? Well, the, I mean, the, what Rhonda's describing is sort of investigating the investigators. We saw a little of this uh, during the Mueller probe, uh, where they similarly were sort of trying to go after the investigators, trying to cast doubt, muddy the waters as much as possible. I mean, Rhonda's right. They really, I mean, they could defund parts of the FBI. Uh, they do control... Uh, the purse. Uh, it, it's worth noting, one, that there is no evidence of corruption at the FBI. Yeah. Two, Chris Ray, the FBI director who was appointed to a 10-year term by Donald Trump, is a lifelong registered Republican. There's never actually been a director of the FBI who was not a Republican, including Jim Comey. Uh, but this idea has taken root in the House GOP conference. Uh, ultimately, I don't think leadership Kevin McCarthy among them will allow the FBI funding to be cut. Uh, it, it undercuts their message about being tough on crime and public safety. Uh, it makes it look like they're sort of carrying water for Trump instead of law and order. But there will certainly be pressure from members of the conference to do so. Uh, and they have the ability to hold hearings. Uh, Jim Jordan is you know, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee now, uh, and he can can call up witnesses. They could hold uh, FBI officials in contempt of Congress. Uh, we're going to see probably Chris Ray uh, held in contempt of Congress soon for an unrelated issue, uh, and uh, you know they'll they'll play hardball. Let's look now at uh, Doral. Of course, this is Trump National Doral Golf Club, located in Miami. It's where Trump has been staying overnight. And we are uh, preparing to watch this procession. Huge security presence, James and Rhonda, uh, as Trump will make his way from Doral to the federal courthouse in Miami, where he will turn himself in. This is the Wilkie D. Ferguson Jr. U.S. courthouse across town in Miami. Aaron, important to note that we're watching something that's sort of hard to wrap your mind around when you step back and think about it. A former president of the United States crossing Miami, Florida to turn himself in into a federal courthouse. Yeah, I mean, it is remarkable. We, we of course, uh, are two months removed from another indictment, um, but that was a, uh, a Manhattan case that was not dealing with federal law. The charges in that case were not as serious as the ones we're talking about now. Um, and we saw kind of a more muted response, at least when it came to demonstrations outside the courthouse in Manhattan. I think um, it is it has been recognized by Trump and by his allies that the charges in this case are more serious. We have seen certainly some rhetoric um, on behalf of people like Kerry Lake, especially that have pushed people into, uh, you know, the idea that they should be on a war footing. We, we see that W word invoked in ways that really uh, hark back to after, uh, you know, rather in the lead up to January 6th. And so, you know, I think it's worth emphasizing that regardless of the uh, your view on the, the charges in this case, regardless of your views on Trump's guilt, this is crossing a, a line in American history. And this is a situation that is very sensitive. We have a former president who has a demonstrated history of inflaming these passions and those passions have uh, very uh, notably, historically, uh, led to a very ugly scene at the U.S. Capitol. And so um, I, I think that we are certainly entering a new phase uh, in this country right now. James, let's talk about this property that we're looking at, uh, Doral in Miami. So usually when we're hearing about Trump properties in Florida, it's Mar-a-Lago, uh, which is in West Palm Beach, Florida, probably about 40 miles away. Uh, this is in Miami. Uh, this is a, a golf course, uh, sort of a, a resort-like setting. Uh, this is owned by the Trump Organization. Uh, originally, uh, Trump, when he was president, wanted to have the G7 summit uh, at Doral. Uh, and ultimately, it sort of fell apart because other countries balked and 
it looked like it was going to be a big profit-making exercise. But Trump loves this property. He's called it one of his crown jewels. Uh, early in her career with the Trump Organization, Ivanka Trump, uh, the former president's daughter, uh, basically ran Dural. Uh, this was part of her portfolio. And uh, he used this as sort of a proving ground for her before giving her more and more responsibilities in the family business. Rhonda, let's talk about the security effort uh, to do this unprecedented thing, right? Bring a former president across an American city to show up in a federal courthouse and go through the processing that people have to undergo when they are charged with crimes. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about how when we covered uh, the Manhattan case, the indictment there, and how the days leading up to it, we kept hearing that, you know, security in New York, the NYPD, as well as the Secret Service just didn't know what to do because we've never had to do this. Uh, I don't know if they now have a template uh, that they follow to take a, a former president or anyone who has a Secret Service detail into a courthouse situation to turn themselves in, uh, but it, it looks as if they might at this point. Um, uh, of course, the president, uh, you know, his family as well, they are Secret Service protectees. Um, and that is from the minute they're leaving uh, that resort there and going into the courthouse. Even though we aren't able to see those images today inside the courthouse, the Secret Service will be there. Uh, but it is such a, an, an interesting juxtaposition where you have Secret Service you know, working with a former president and their legal team to turn him over to local law enforcement and federal law enforcement. And there have been various things where the Secret Service, you know, for example, in New York and in Georgia, they don't want Donald Trump to be handcuffed because they say for security reasons, the, the protectee needs to be able to defend himself or move quickly if he comes under attack. Uh, in, that was respected in Manhattan. I presume it's going to be respected today. Uh, the Secret Service sent a team, just like whenever there's any kind of event, you would send an advance team. They sent an advance team to this courthouse in Georgia last week to check everything out, uh, guard the building, look at all the entrances and exits, figure out the safest way in and out. Uh, and it's, it, it, it's an incredibly unusual situation for them to be in because ultimately they too are part of law enforcement, but they're mission and job is very different uh, than, than their counterparts, uh, you know, it, it, in the FBI and others who are uh, investigating and charging the former president. If you're just joining us, you're looking at live images of Trump National Doral Golf Club. It's in Miami, and we expect the former president and current presidential candidate to make his way across the city to the federal courthouse, where he uh, has his first appearance today in relation to these charges stemming from his handling and then refusal to turn over classified documents that contained highly sensitive information, uh, sensitive information that included, James, documents about America's nuclear program, about America's defense vulnerabilities, and other uh, really sensitive, almost doesn't go far enough to talk right. about how it's so sensitive. How da dangerous these could be if in the wrong hands. It's so sensitive that the code words uh, are themselves classified. Yeah. Uh, you know, code word classified. This isn't just secret. This isn't top secret. This is, uh, you know, uh, information about nuclear capabilities, information about vulnerabilities of the United States, information about U.S. troops, uh, about U.S. plans to, contingency plans to attack Iran if necessary. As we're watching the motorcade come out of Dural, uh, I'm thinking about the optics of Trump leaving from Mar-a-Lago, which is where the crimes are alleged to have taken place. And uh, even though Dural is closer, it means it's a shorter motorcade. Uh, there's a, a very good convenience reason the Secret Service doesn't like long, winding motorcades. It creates more vulnerability. Uh, it, it, it is uh, a little optically better uh, for Trump to be coming from this other property that he owns instead of where uh, all the documents were stored and the alleged obstruction took place. Aaron Blake, what's going through your mind as you watch this motorcade traverse Miami? Yeah, I actually wanted to pick up on something that James just mentioned here, which was the just this the the sensitivity of these documents. I think one of the challenges here in prosecuting the case, at least the public relations case against Donald Trump, if you're if you're a critic of Donald Trump, 
is that uh, we may never really know exactly what kind of documents these were. And that's because they are so highly sensitive that sharing that information with the public is not something the United States government wants to be able to do. And so, uh, I, I, you know, I think the question is, you know, certainly the jurors are going to be made to appreciate the gravity of that situation. Uh, but when it comes to Donald Trump himself uh, and, and, you know, the public case that's being made against him, is the public ever going to be able to truly appreciate what kinds of documents he was supposedly putting at risk by keeping them out of, uh, outside of a secured environment? And I think this, you know, the fact that we have an indictment now means that a lot of these issues that have only been dealt with in very broad terms, uh, you know, we saw a very quick reaction from Republicans after the search of Mar-a-Lago back in August. Uh, we're, we're now going to get a more uh, real discussion of the merits of this case that we haven't really seen before and that Republicans are going to have to contend with. But as far as kind of the severity of the actual threat that was posed here, it may not ultimately be something that the American public ever truly understands for very significant and very important reasons. Um, but I think that is kind of one layer of this that we need to remember as we move forward in this case. Aaron, beyond the questions about just what's in those documents, what stands out to you in the indictment as prosecutors are trying to build this case, not just that Donald Trump hung on to some documents, uh, but that he refused to turn them over and then was aware of his actions? Yeah, I think there's a couple things. One is the the amount of times that the um, prosecutors, the, the government in this case, referenced Donald Trump's comments about classified documents from the past. This was clearly done to drive home the point that Donald Trump knew the seriousness of having these documents in an unsecured settle, uh, setting. It gets at the idea that he satisfies the particular statute here, which is in the Espionage Act, uh, Section 793E, which requires that the person involved will have known this information was very sensitive and could be used, not that they necessarily intended for it to be used, but that it could be used to cause injury to the United States. The other thing that I'm really looking forward, uh, looking to, to watch looking forward is the role of uh, Donald Trump's lawyers in this, and specifically Evan Corcoran, who was forced to testify in this case because the court ruled that he might have been party to some things that um, you know, were involved in crimes. Uh, Evan Corcoran's notes are going to figure significantly in this. The indictment describes several of them with Trump basically alluding to the idea that maybe it would be a good idea if certain documents were plucked out of what was being returned to the FBI. Uh, you know, wouldn't it be great if there were no documents? Uh, referring to Hillary Clinton's aide who deleted emails approvingly in a very suggestive way. I think, the, you know, the government in that indictment doesn't drive home the idea that Donald Trump was trying to get rid of these documents. Uh, but certainly that seems to be the implication of what they are saying. They're, they're saying that at least he was hinting in that direction. And I would expect to hear a whole lot more about that moving forward, especially since it very much fits the, the kind of history of Donald Trump here and his interactions with his lawyers and, and with others, where he'll kind of hint in the direction of something uh, in a way that may give him plausible deniability, but creates all kinds of problems for them. And of course, this is going to be something that's going to be, uh, you know, the, the, the government is going to dive into this significantly in this case, I would expect. Aaron Blake, senior political writer, thank you so much. Uh, James and Rhonda, we are used to presidential motorcades shutting down Washington, D.C. However, to see this procession go through Miami and shut down traffic in Miami. Now, when a president comes to your town to give a speech or unveil something, it can cause some traffic jams. But we're watching this shutdown happen with the bird's eye view. Uh, it, it, it is remarkable to see Miami have to come to a standstill in the middle of the day for this to go through traffic. Yeah, and just like we witnessed uh, in Manhattan, a, a city where there is always traffic. Traffic had to stop. And, and we just saw images of the police keeping the traffic on the highway back until that motorcade clears. Uh, I was just looking at the map. This uh, ride would normally take about 27 minutes, although because the motorcade is getting clear traffic, he might get there uh, faster. But again, these are stunning images, and images I feel we just watched just in a different location. 
Um, and, and, you know, I'm thinking as I, I'm watching this, we've used the word unprecedented this week, historic, uh, and, and we've used those words quite a lot throughout the, the presidency of Donald Trump and the post-presidency, that we're, we're witnessing things that we have never as a country witnessed before. And, and it is a moment just to, to step back and look at the images. I'm struck by the, the relatively low speed uh, that they're moving. Uh, you know, this is the, well, we heard a lot of these things uh, in New York when people were comparing it to the O.J. Simpson chase, you know, but this is, uh, they're, they're going below the speed limit here. They are not uh, speeding to the courthouse. Yeah, what's similar uh, about it, this to O.J. Simpson is our eyes, exactly, right? It's exactly. the presence, yeah, of, right. Yeah, it's yes. the presence yes, it's of people not, yes. watching it, people wrapped at attention, obviously a totally different circumstance, but what they have in common is that we are watching this progression. Um, James, I, I want to just interrupt you briefly to go to Rich Matthews because he is outside uh, the courthouse in Miami, the Wilkie D. Ferguson Jr. U.S. Courthouse. Rich, as you probably know, the former president and his entourage, his Secret Service protection are on their way to where you are. What are you hearing from protesters there today? You know, uh, the protesters here, the people here also know that the president, uh, the former president, is on the way. Uh, and we've heard some cheers, some chanting. I want to show you, uh, we talked earlier about the media circus here and the media village. Uh, a lot of these networks have security that keep uh, people back from their live shots, to keep them from interrupting the live shots. And then there's a little roadblock that the uh, police department, Aaron, I know you have to walk this way to see it, uh, but they set up with their bicycles and then the, the officers are right there and any time that it does get a little heated any time that uh, the protesters that are pro-Trump and anti-Trump come together those bicycle officers have actually carried their bikes out here and then set them up around the people who are uh, agitating for lack of a better word um, I want to show you a little bit more you can see back here lots of flag Trump flag American flags, uh, uh, we saw the hammer and sickle earlier, and uh, again, just a lot of people here uh, both showing their, their support for former President Trump and also some people, uh, there's a man here dressed as a convict with a ball and chain. Uh, but, but again, the overwhelming majority of people that we're seeing here that have come out are supporting the president. Libby? And Rich, talk to us more about security and what that footprint is like. We got a sense of it there, but tell us more. Yeah, so, you know, interestingly, there's a large percentage of the, of the security, I don't want to say hidden, but, but it's not in plain sight. So when we have that situation earlier with the television that had the uh, threatening message on it, okay, when we had that issue, uh, federal officers came virtually running out from the uh, from the building to handle that back to you Libby right, thanks so much uh, pretty noisy down there outside of the courthouse thank you Rich Matthews we'll continue to check in with him especially as that motorcade uh, proceeds over to the courthouse you know if you just tuned in what Rich was talking about was a security question that came up earlier he was pointing out that uh, TV that had writing on it had been left out as like a protest sign and police cleared the area to make sure it was not dangerous and then people were allowed to come back. You also saw there near Rich uh, vehicles that were being used as the physical barricade, the physical barrier. So we're not talking about bike racks, we're talking about vehicles being used as a protective measure. As we watch this motorcade go across Miami. Let's bring in Jacqueline Alemany, congressional investigations reporter. She joins us live. Uh, Jackie, you reported a really essential story looking at the evidence in this case and how a lot of it, according to prosecutors, is coming from inside Mar-a-Lago. It's coming from people who worked with and knew Donald Trump, whether they were assistants or whether they were lawyers. Talk to us about that. Yeah, Libby, there's really a plethora of evidence that Jack Smith and prosecutors have obtained uh, over the years since the special counsel was formed. And I have to say something that's a bit at odds with um, what our legal analyst just said, which is that uh, I do feel like actually there is so much evidence that even in the potential case that uh, Eileen Cannon or Trump's legal team makes a bid to have Evan Corcoran's evidence that was included in the investigation that was listed as attorney one in that 49-page 
uh, indictment, even if that is removed from what prosecutors can use in the case, there is still so much more that has been collected from people uh, like Walt Nada, who is actually listed as a co-conspirator with former President Trump, is appearing with him today, appeared with him over the weekend. Uh, all signs show that he's going to remain uh, as loyal as he has been. Um, both of them, the president, the former president and Walt, made false statements. Um, some of those provided by uh, former Mar-a-Lago employees. Uh, other incidents, such as uh, Trump showing a sensitive map um, of an undisclosed country to a Trump super PAC uh, employee, for someone with Trump Save America. So all of this information is, is coming from people on the inside, uh, along with a lot of the information that we read from Evan Corcoran, Trump's former lawyer, um, who's actually still working on January 6 matters, but recused himself from the Mar-a-Lago documents case after he became a, a essentially a witness uh, against Trump. And how remarkable is that turn of events, Jackie, from being an attorney to being a witness? It's pretty remarkable, Libby, although it's uh, sort of become the status quo with the former president. He often gets uh, representing him comes with exposing yourself to some some legal jeopardy here. Um, but this certainly is a, a bit of an unusual case where you had um, Corcoran, who took extensive notes uh, and recorded um, himself, at least memorializing some of his conversations with former President Trump, uh, being used in this case after a, a judge ordered him to provide that information. He had initially said, you know, this is protected by attorney-client privilege. Um, the judge, uh, prosecutors asked for that privilege to be waived. Trump's legal team, which did not include Evan Corcoran himself, actually, but include um, other, pro other defense uh, lawyers on Trump's team, Tim Parlatore, Lindsey Halligan, uh, Jim trustee and, and John Rowley, who had signed on to um, maintain that privilege. It ultimately was waived. Corcoran provided the notes. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, there's been a lot of back and forth, a lot of lawyering over the past few months, but it's been uh, pretty remarkable, remarkable to see what Jack Smith has been able to successfully put together through uh, a lot of these court battles that we've seen play out. Mm. And you and Josh Dossi report, of course, that Trump's lawyers fought his testimony r r really vigorously and that you also say that his testimony rattled Trump. What does that mean exactly? I, I think that the expectation would be, in, in general, I mean, there's some disagreement over this, depending on what which legal expert you speak with, that the extent to which Corcoran memorialized his notes, the the detail, um, the verbatim quotes that are included in the indictment um, was sort of a bridge too far for what a normal lawyer uh, would be doing in some sort of normal legal practices. Of course, uh, the uh, opposing side of that argument would be that with Trump especially, um, you need to be very careful as to document every single conversation you have with him as to sort of inure yourself um, to any potential future legal issues. Um, but of course, a lot of lawyers are criticizing Corcoran for, for um, in their view, you know, n taking too detailed note. Uh, in, and um, something that lawyers traditionally don't do in in these sorts of cases. Of course, it is it is you know sort of unusual that Corcoran would be a witness against Trump to begin with. Um, but as one uh, attorney who um, we were speaking with, who has uh, knowledge of what's going on um, with Trump's legal team, told us uh, you know that that these conversations and what Corcoran had memorialized appeared more to be like a novel uh, than just, you know, lawyer notes. Mm. Uh, Jackie, one question we all have is just who will be representing Donald Trump going forward in this case? T tell us about sort of the, the challenges he's faced in retaining lawyers and what you're watching in terms of who will be representing him, not just today, but going forward. Yeah, Libby, this is a well-worn uh, pattern that the former president has found himself in of 
running through lawyers and then scrambling to replace the ones that have either just been fired or resigned ahead of um, whatever new court date has appeared. And that is uh, uh, another news cycle that we're in the midst of right now. Um, two of Trump's lawyers unexpectedly resigned last week, Jim Trustee and John Rowley, the two lawyers um, who have really been with Trump throughout this ordeal. Another one of his longtime lawyers on the Mar-a-Lago documents case, Tim Parlatore, quit in April. Uh, so there's been quite a bit of turnover on this team. And, and Trump spent the last few days scrambling to search for and hire a new lawyer, specifically someone who has Florida experience, who understands the courts in the state. Um, Todd Blanche has taken the helm. You know, he joined the team earlier this year to represent Trump in the case that Alvin Bragg has brought against him. Now Blanche is taking an expanded role. Um, he does have, uh, you know, a very um, prestigious background, is well regarded and has experience with high profile um, federal cases like this. He defended Paul Manafort successfully in, in New York, um, but Trump has yet to find that Florida local lawyer to join the team. There's a number of names that we reported on yesterday, people like Ben Cuny, um, names that our viewers might not be familiar with, but people who are respected and well-known in the state. But, uh, you know, Trump's team is coming up against the usual pitfalls, which is a reticence to put their, uh, you know, reputation as a lawyer in danger by taking this case on, um, the potential to not get paid as former President Trump is notorious for not paying his legal bills or for signing on to work with a, a notoriously capricious uh, and fickle client who often doesn't just eschew legal advice, but then uh, actually engages in further illegal activity down the line. Hey, Rhonda, Jackie just brought up some remarkable points. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything from getting paid to realizing you might be at the whims of a client who, who might turn around and fire you uh, very quickly because he's a track record of doing that. And a client you really can't control because at the end of the day, that is a huge concern, especially when you're trying to build a case as big as this and fight it. And Rhonda, I, I just want to mention as we watch Donald Trump's motorcade, they are arriving at the federal courthouse in Miami. They made this travel through the city of Miami going from Doral, uh, his uh, golf club and resort, to the federal courthouse. This is really a traditional motorcade, Rhonda, the kind you'd see, uh, frankly, for the president. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what the Secret Service detail has deemed as the safe footprint for this journey, James. Yeah, and I think we just saw, I think that was uh, Chris LaCivita uh, leaning out of one of the suburban windows using his phone. Uh, he's one of, essentially, Trump's campaign managers on the reelect. Let's go to Rich Matthews, who's live there on the scene. Rich. Yeah, we can hear the motorcade, uh, the sirens from the motorcade arriving. And again, uh, the energy is certainly picked up here. Chants of USA. Uh, the courthouse just here, this way. And again, lots of people have uh, moved this way to, uh, to try to get a glimpse of the president and his motorcade coming in. Again, as we pan around, you see all the American flags, the Trump flags, uh, Trump Pence 2024. And again, you know, right here, security uh, for, for a lot of the news crews, uh, just in case something goes wrong. And Aaron, if we walk this way, as the, uh, as the, uh, as the courthouse security, as a federal and Miami-Dade police prepare for his imminent arrival here, you can see that those bicycle police have now moved forward. And uh, Aaron, this will be a tough shot, but if you can see the DHS gentlemen back there, there are uh, numerous federal marshals, U.S. marshals, that have come outside now uh, that, again, had been securing the courthouse from the inside throughout most of the day, but they're now out here as uh, former President Trump arrives. Libby? Uh, Rich, we'll be watching to see just how uh, the crowd reacts there. Um, what are you hearing from people that their message is to Donald Trump or to the federal authorities who are now prosecuting him? Yeah, you know, the uh, the messages here have been uh, almost unanimously pro-Trump, uh, a lot of pro-USA. In fact, again, you might have just heard the chant of USA uh, coming up. Uh, we have heard some people, uh, again, yell at the courthouse, yell at the officers. Uh, there was a big group of mo a motorcade of motorcycle police officers that some of the uh, anti or some of the pro-Trump protesters were yelling at, uh, calling them uh, 
you know, uh, dictators and uh, saying that they are going after the president, the uh, former president, simply because he is the leader of the opposition party. Rich, Trump will be inside of that courthouse. And do you, are you going to be watching to see if these protesters stick around throughout the day? And do you have a sense of where they go next from here, how they're going to continue to show their support for him? Boy, that's, I mean, that's a, where do they go next is a great question. Will they stick around? Uh, I don't want to sound biased here, but I will say with all of the cameras here, and most of these cameras will be doing live shots until, you know, at least evening hours, I would expect that a lot of these folks will stay here. Um, but you're also going to have some leave as soon as the former president does. I will tell you that we've been out here since about 8 o'clock this morning, and while it was busy earlier, it is certainly the largest crowd right now. In the last uh, maybe two hours, the crowd here has probably doubled or tripled, um, but it's still not the 50,000 that the uh, Miami police chief said was kind of worst case scenario they were expecting. Uh, Aaron, not if you agree with me, but I'm thinking 5,000 people, 4,000 people, including the media here. Um, no more than that by any means. Libby? And Aaron is the video journalist who's there which, with Rich Matthews on the scene. And of course, when we talk about worst case scenarios, what he's talking about is in terms of the security presence, making sure that everything's safe, making sure that the police are prepared. Let's talk, James, about that security footprint and what the Secret Service had to take into account today. So it's a, it's a large perimeter, and you mentioned that it's a motorcade that you'd normally expect for a sitting president. I've been to a, a lot of Trump events over the last year where he had a three or four car motorcade. They do really adjust the security footprint based on the potential threat. Uh, obviously, a lot of visibility around this. So I think it was a 16-car motorcade. You know, you tip, it's very typical for an ambulance to travel with the, uh, the current president, not so much the former president, but in this case, because of the elevated threat they did. There's a lot of other uh, measures in place that you don't necessarily see on camera. For example, when Trump's motorcade is moving, they have jamming devices going. Uh, and so when you have your cell phone, uh, and you're in or near the presidential motorcade, your cell phone doesn't work. Uh, that's in case there are IEDs or any kind of situation like that. So there are quite a lot of countermeasures. They really have clearly, uh, out of an abundance of caution, staked a very large perimeter. You look at some of these aerial shots uh, and the barriers that are up, those are just the kind of the first level of barrier. Uh, you have kind of, if for some reason those barriers were breached, I think learning from what happened on January 6th and other uh, cases, you have second, third, fourth level barriers. That's just to even get inside the courthouse where there are going to be magnetometers. Uh, and, uh, you know, Trump, by going in the uh, essentially the, the uh, uh, basically the, the back entrance, the underground entrance, uh, avoids any kind of interaction at all uh, with anyone who hasn't been cleared through security, hasn't gone through the mags. Mm -hmm. Jackie Alemany, talk to us from your reporter perspective about what it's like to see this moment unfolding, uh, the supporters for Trump standing outside and the preparations being made inside this building to see Donald Trump come in and go through the court processing that takes place during your first court appearance. Yeah, Libby, well, obviously I'm not on the ground, but based on my experience covering Trump's New York appearance, um, I can tell you this is, uh, there was a, a scramble to get ready for today um, from a, a local and federal law enforcement perspective. Uh, and it appears that there are far more people that have showed up in Miami to support Donald Trump than did in New York. And that was uh, a bit of a logistical nightmare. There were people waiting overnight to get into the courthouse. We had, uh, we hired um, college students to wait in line to make sure uh, that we're getting a place to uh, be able to, to witness the historic events of the day. Even once um, our colleagues, uh, Shana Jacobs, David Ovale, actually get inside the courthouse uh, in, in right there in, in Miami, they're not going to be allowed to use their phones. So we're not going to have a readout of what exactly Jack Smith and um, Justice Department prosecutors who are on his team are arguing in court. We're not going to know uh, what Donald Trump looked like during that appearance until after the fact. There are lots of rules around, you know, pictures being taken, recordings taken, um, and and what exactly, exactly can be uh, 
you know, distributed and and shown from uh, this appearance. So we're playing a little bit of a waiting game right now, and obviously there um, is a groundswell of, of support for Donald Trump in his what has sort of become his home state uh, in the first federal indictment against a former president. Jackie, I'm so glad you took us through the reporting process of what's going to unfold in the next little while because it's important and it reveals a lot about how all of us, all Americans, everyone else watching too around the world, will be able to learn what happens inside the courthouse. So take us through what you as a journalist would be watching for, what our colleagues who are in there will be watching for and listening for as they are our eyes and ears. Yeah, well, what I will tell you is that uh, it is a stressful moment being a reporter in there and having to listen and take notes and not being able to record it. Um, you know, audio recording can be the coin of the realm for any journalist. So you are sitting there, this is um, what we did in New York as well, and really trying to scribble down every single word that is said during this appearance. Usually um, the judge goes, toggles back and forth between the defendant and prosecutors. Prosecutors, uh, this is an appearance and an arraignment, so they're, they're, uh, it's likely that there is going to be um, more back and forth and actually potentially new substantive evidence and materials that are put forward along with sort of um, the rules of the road. Um, you know, an argument from the prosecutors potentially, as we saw in New York, to prevent Donald Trump from tweeting or sharing anything on social media uh, that might attack judges or attack prosecutors who are involved in this case or ask him to refrain from sharing anything about the evidence that's being shared in this case, which is actually potentially even more important in this case because a lot of that evidence is about classified information. There's obviously tons of rules and laws around um, the sensitivities around these documents and how they can be shared. Even the lawyers who um, uh, ultimately are going to be privy to these documents, they have to sign they have to go through and get their security clearance. They have to sign non-disclosure agreements. So if you're Shana or David right now, you are getting ready to listen as closely as possible. Um, usually uh, you do it in shifts. So one reporter leaves the courtroom after um, the first part of the this, this hearing and this appearance happens, goes out to a place where they can use their phone and reports back to the newsroom what exactly went down. And the second reporter um, stays in that courtroom. Usually you're not allowed to go back in and listens to the remainder of the hearing, comes back out, file a story uh, as quickly as possible, again, without um, transcriptions or audio recordings of what has been said. Jackie, you mentioned social media and how we may be hearing some guidelines on that. We'll see how that evolves over the course of the day and really the coming weeks. What has Trump's strategy been thus far on social media as he talks about this investigation? Yeah, Libby, well, it's a, a tricky and delicate situation for all parties involved. Obviously, uh, Trump uses social media to his advantage to put out messages and sort of the framing that he so desires when it comes to this story overall, that the Department of Justice and, and uh, the legal system has been weaponized against him and is biased against conservatives overall, that, uh, you know, there was prosecutorial misconduct. You've, are, you've also seen him in the past um, explicitly attack those who are involved in some of the legal proceedings, Alvin Bragg in New York. Uh, he's been already after Jack Smith for a number of, of months now. And if you're a judge that's presiding over this proceeding, you also need to be a little bit careful because this is someone who obviously is running for office, uses social media as an arm and a, an important tool for that campaign. You don't want to restrict uh, the former president's freedom of speech. We heard that in New York during that that proceeding in, in front of uh, a judge whom Trump had attacked quite repeatedly. Um, but uh, you also don't want to add fuel to the fire. Obviously, um, this is a political figure who is able to turn a lot of things that happened to him against him. Uh, you know, if he if he, if there is sort of a, a ban or some sort of moratorium on certain types of speech that Trump can engage in, you're going to see Trump and his his campaign team try to spin that around and use that to their advantage. Um, we'll see what exactly 
the prosecutors asked for in this case. Again, it's going to be a little bit different since this is about classified information and there are a lot of sensitivities around that. Um, but generally speaking, I think we can expect the prosecutor, prosecutors to make at least some preliminary and basic asks about what Trump is sharing on social media. Jackie Alemany, thank you so much. James, why is that relevant in terms of both the case, as Jackie talked about, that prosecutors are building, and how Trump could you know, be jeopardizing his own case, frankly, if you're one of his lawyers, you might not want him to be talking about this, but also because of the nature of this sensitive information that he's had access to. Yeah, so it's, I mean, there's an inside and an outside game here that Trump is playing. And so there's the, the legal case, and then there's the political arena where he's trying to become president again. Uh, and, you know, from a lawyer's perspective, the best thing is for your client to say nothing. You don't, you don't want them giving any potential fodder to the prosecution. From the prosecution's perspective, it's on the one hand nice when a defendant is saying something that could potentially be incriminating or uh, outlining potential defenses that don't really add up or that undercut other things that he said. On the other hand, it's incredibly frustrating for prosecutors because they can't really respond. Uh, you can't, you know, you have to file court motions. It's not like Jack Smith can have his own truth social account and be pushing back on falsehoods that Trump may be presenting or, you know, his side of the story. If this was not a former president, if this was just a normal defendant, if this was someone like Jack Teixeira, the guy who was behind allegedly the discord leaks of classified information, the Justice Department would say this is someone who has access to classified material, is divulging it, and would probably ask to keep them behind bars pending trial. You wouldn't let that person out. Teixeira is behind bars. Uh, but of course, that's not even under consideration. Uh, the, the government would ask for that in this case. Similarly, you know, Merrick Garland is staying very hands off because he doesn't want this to seem political. He's totally deferred to Jack Smith as the special counsel. I think that they would be extraordinarily hesitant to ask for any kind of gag rule that would restrict what an active candidate for political office could say, because ultimately there are First Amendment equities to consider, but also it just is a, a bad look uh, when it looks like it's, you know, Trump is going after the so-called deep state that the government is trying to limit his ability to defend himself in public. So it's, it's a balancing act for prosecutors. Uh, we'll see what comes out of this, but I imagine they're going to be incredibly careful about what it is that they do ask for. Former President Donald Trump arriving there at the Miami Federal Courthouse. This is an initial court appearance, and Jackie was just lining out what could be happening today and how our reporters will be in that uh, courthouse, Rhonda, mm -hmm. telling us about what goes on behind those closed doors. The rules around federal courthouses are very strict. Mm -hmm. Everything from cameras, photographs, recording devices. Uh, so we are really relying on the old-fashioned reporting techniques and the information that our colleagues will be bringing out. Um, regular people could stand in line, though, and also get access to this court appearance today. That's right. The courthouse is a public place. You know, you have people who are there to go to work and, and come and go. Uh, so that, that also adds to the security concerns as well. Um, and, and back to what James was saying about the lawyers and how tough it is to have a client who may go on to social later today. We know he is expected to speak to supporters later on at, at his home in Bedminster, New Jersey. Uh, if you remember back to the Manhattan case, the judge there did ask the lawyers to please contain your client because he's putting threats out there. And that's a real, real concern. And then also you look at the legal aspect of it too. Think back to if you uh, caught the town hall that CNN had with Trump. E. Jean Carroll, in that case, decided to file new uh, requests for damages because of what he said on air at that time. So again, we are, we're in mm. such unprecedented times where you have this client who typically does not listen to too many people uh, and, and can also hit the airwaves and present this in the way he wants to. And then his lawyers are going to have to figure out how to make that work. A jury had just decided for Ms. Carroll and that she was awarded damages from Trump. Uh, and what does he do? He goes out and continues to talk, even though one of the issues is defamation, James. So if yeah. you're his lawyer, you're like, yeah. You can understand why, you know, they keep quitting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's incredibly uh, difficult. Let, let's talk about that for a minute because Mr. Trustee, one of his former attorneys, was just on television last week on the eve of this 
indictment coming down and is no longer one of his lawyers. So can you talk about that disconnect between lawyers going out and being not just the, 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 the person who's working behind the scenes, but the public face of defending him and then no longer on the case. Yeah, for, I mean, for half a century now, Donald Trump has seen lawyers going back to Roy Cohn, who was Joseph McCarthy's top chief counsel uh, in the McCarthy army hearings, uh, really seeing lawyers as essentially PR people, mm -hmm. that, that, that he sees that as part of their role, to be out there selling him, defending him. He wants his lawyers on TV fighting for him. Uh, ultimately, to Libby's question, with Trusty and his colleague, resigning from the legal team, it comes down to a disagreement about legal strategy. Uh, there is this question of you actually have real legal jeopardy. You're going to go in a courtroom. A Miami jury pool is very different than a D.C. jury pool. You know, some of those, uh, the kinds of people who are standing outside protesting for Donald Trump right now, their friends or family members may be on that jury pool. You can strike jurors and such. The Trump attorneys only have to convince one juror uh, that Trump isn't guilty or that he's not guilty beyond a reasonable doubt or that this is a you know, so-called witch hunt. And uh, so in that case, even if the evidence is overwhelmingly strong, if you can convince just one juror, uh, you know, maybe it's someone who's a, a Cuban emigre who uh, worries that uh, government shouldn't be going after former leaders and you can essentially coax jury nullification. That is a legal strategy. It could work. Uh, what his been dividing the Trump legal team is sort of how much to fight the government, to take on the deep state, to put the government on trial in this case, uh, versus just trying to pick apart the individual case. Uh, and so the, you know, the really the lawyer at the center of this is this guy, Boris Epstein, uh, who, who was a longtime Trump advisor. Uh, he hasn't really practiced law, uh, but he is in Trump's ear saying, you've got to put the government on trial here. Uh, and then you have these more conventional, traditional lawyers who are saying, no, that's really, this is, this is not the place for that. You can do that at political rallies, but in this courtroom, you know, fight the case that's before you. And Trump hasn't shown a willingness to do that. And so several of these gentlemen have left his legal orbit as a result. We're looking at live images outside of this Miami federal courthouse where Donald Trump is making his initial court appearance. He is facing 37 charges. Uh, Rhonda, some of these charges come with a maximum sentence of 10 years. Some of these charges come with a maximum sentence of 20 years. I mean, these are very serious charges. Yeah, they're very serious, and I, I don't think we can underscore that enough because there there is an extreme gravity with this case. One thing that keeps coming back to my mind is that during this investigation uh, with the DOJ and the FBI, when they were uncovering some of these classified documents, they had to seek extra clearance because they did not have the clearance to even touch or look at these documents. So that shows you the level of sensitive material that uh, was in the, the boxes. Um, and I don't think that can be said enough. This is, this is something where the boxes were moved around in different parts of Mar-a-Lago, um, apparently, according to the indictment, under Trump's direction, under his knowledge. Uh, so yes, this, this is an incredible time and an incredible case to, to look at and see how it plays out. Mm. Let's head back to Rich Matthews, who's live outside the courthouse. So Rich, the former president, has arrived there. What is the mood now and what are you seeing? Well, you know, there was a, a, a loud cheer uh, from the crowd as the president, the former president, arrived here at the courthouse. And one interesting thing, uh, I, I've been mentioning quite frequently that most of the people here are supporting the former president. However, as the motorcade approached the courthouse, one person uh, dressed in a chain gang outfit actually tried to jump into the street, walk into the street in front of the motorcade. He was pushed back by law enforcement officers. Uh, and, uh, you know, really, the incident only took a couple of seconds. Um, it's not just protesters here, by the way. There are politicians here. Uh, Carrie Lake is standing just a few feet from me right now. She's here to speak on President Trump's behalf. Earlier, uh, Vivek uh, was here to speak on President Trump's behalf. Uh, obviously, some of the other politicians, uh, Chris Christie uh, and Asa Hutchinson, are, are not supporting uh, former President Trump. But I did want to point out that it's not just uh, kind of random people, not just protesters uh, walking aimlessly here. There are several organized groups. I've also seen uh, blacks for Trump, Cubans for Trump. And uh, 
you know, there's been talk about Proud Boys being here. I will, I will tell you, I have not seen anything that is obviously uh, a Proud Boy. I haven't seen anyone saying they're with the Proud Boys. Uh, so again, unclear if they are here, but they have been saying they would be here to protest. Uh, right now, though, the energy level again has, has certainly raised here at the courthouse with uh, people on both sides of the aisle understanding that the former president is inside. We don't expect him to be here very long. Again, this pro procedure should take maybe 30 minutes at most, and that he's expected to go back to the airport and head to New Jersey for his fundraiser and press conference tonight. Libby? Thanks so much, Rich. Uh, James mentioned Vivek. So we're talking about Vivek Ramaswamy, presidential candidate on the Republican side of the aisle. Why is he there? He wants to ride this you know, media circus to his own advantage. He's running for president. He's been campaigning probably more aggressively than anyone else, spending more time in Iowa, flew down there, appeared outside the courthouse earlier today. He has said that uh, this is an unjust prosecution. He would pardon Trump if he is elected president, but then said, let's turn the page, let's have generational change, uh, you know, basically trying to thread this needle. Uh, we're seeing the different 2024 candidates take different tacks where they're similarly trying to thread the needle in their own ways. Ron DeSantis is an interesting figure because he is the governor of Florida, the state that Trump is currently in. Uh, you might recall after the Manhattan charges, he said, I don't know about paying off porn stars, uh, but and then defended Trump. Here he said, I was in the Navy, I was a JAG officer, uh, I know how important it is to responsibly handle classified information, but this also seems like a witch hunt that they're going after Trump. So it's, it's trying to both take a dig, but also not frontally attack Trump, be seen as defending him, but also creating a permission structure for Republicans to maybe move away. The uh, Vivek Ramaswamy event is coming against the backdrop of a CBS YouGov poll that came out on Sunday, which showed that only 7% of Republican voters say that these charges, that this indictment makes them less likely to support Trump. 14% said that it would make them more likely to support Trump, and more than 60% said it would have no difference at all. Republicans are seeing these public polls, they're looking at internal polls, and they're behaving accordingly. Mm. You know, Rhonda, it is such an interesting dynamic. This is happening in Florida, but it is a federal charge, a federal courthouse. Very different than in New York and what we saw there when we were looking at um, a, a very different structure of, sort of who's in control and who's in charge. Ron DeSantis can't do a whole lot about this right now. No, exactly right. It, it's a federal charge. Federal courthouses all play out under federal uh, court rules. So, um, you know, Ron DeSantis can't uh, intervene in any way or, or even play any role really in any of this. Uh, I'll also add on what, what's so interesting that this is playing against the backdrop of the 2024 election. Uh, the mayor of Miami, I was watching his uh, press conference yesterday. He is someone who has kind of hinted that he may uh, try to run as Republican uh, candidate as well in 24. So there, there's, there, there's so much overlap right now about the election and about how it's all playing out uh, while uh, Trump is under indictment here, New York, uh, potentially in Georgia as well. Um, and again, we're just all waiting to see what happens. All right, Trump is in that courthouse. Let's go now to investigative reporter Spencer S. Shu. Spencer, thank you for joining us. Walk us through the timeline of the investigation and how we have reached this really unprecedented moment. So the you know, key point was January 20th, 2021, when President Trump left the White House. At that point, uh, documents that he retained, which were the property of the government, and he was no longer authorized to uh, hold or handle classified information. You know, the backdrop to this is we should note that uh, President Trump was said by his own aides to be reckless with his handling of classified information. He famously showed uh, an Iranian missile launch site off. He tweeted that, which uh, showed the capabilities of U.S. satellites. He shared with a Russian diplomat information that was uh, came from Israel, from a confidential source in an Islamic state, um, potentially revealing a, a human source. He took briefing papers, um, you know, from his intelligence briefs, maps, charts to his private residential quarters and didn't return them. So against this backdrop, uh, he was briefed by his White House counsel that uh, he needed to send documents to the National Archives when he left office. So, a law since the Watergate era and President Richard Nixon leaving uh, the White House. Um, but instead, he directed boxes and boxes to be taken to Mar-a-Lago. And the indictment charges um, that after a year of efforts, um, the uh, National Archives started asking him in May 2021 to return these boxes 
um, that um, following a year, uh, uh, the National Archives, they, uh, the, sorry, the uh, Trump administration, or excuse me, President Trump, former President Trump returned 15 boxes. Inside those boxes, um, NARA, the National Archives officials, found about 197 classified documents. They referred this to the FBI and the Justice Department. The investigation began that March. A grand jury was impaneled in April. Um, and then he was issued a subpoena at that point, a formal request from a, uh, in a criminal investigation to return uh, documents with classified markings. Um, after that, he reviewed, had 64 boxes taken to his residence. He, his aide returned 30 documents, 30 boxes, excuse me, um, to a storage area that he told his lawyer to go search in response to the subpoena. The lawyer found another 37 documents, but um, the government then saw that uh, video recordings that showed a movement of these boxes, asked, uh, and, and that led to an additional search by the FBI in August where another uh, more than 100 classified documents were found. Uh, the government has developed charges of obstruction alleged against President Trump and against one of his aides that moved those boxes allegedly. Stay with this, Spencer. I just want to go back to James for this perspective of how significant it is to be asked to turn over documents and then go through this prolonged process, as Spencer is talking about, a subpoena, a search ultimately, and uh, and this discovery that people knew the boxes were there. It's not like they were in some very hidden storage closet three layers down, right? They were really hidden in plain sight, if, if you will. How significant is that in this situation? It, it's it's very significant, and I'm really glad Spencer walked us through that timeline because this wasn't sort of a surprise raid that they came and discovered documents. This was multiple requests at the highest levels of government, you know, the top people at the National Archives asking for documents, getting stonewalled by Trump and his attorneys, then the FBI getting involved, going and asking, being told, no, there's not any more documents. We've turned over the documents that there are. With these boxes, it's not like they were marked with magic marker that said top secret documents. A lot of the, the very the sensitive, boxes. the boxes, right. you know, they were, that doesn't excuse the behavior at all. It, it, it's secret documents that are mixed in with uh, terror sheets from newspapers, with uh, random, you know, in some cases, razors uh, were found in these boxes. And so it, it was kind of this hodgepodge of things this gets ultimately to the charging decision. They did not charge him for violating the Presidential Records Act. They did not charge him uh, for you know, just merely possession of these documents. That's one of the key differences between the Trump case and the Biden and Pence cases. Uh, in those cases, Biden and Pence fully cooperated. They allowed a full consensual search and turned over the documents that they had. Uh, and Trump didn't do that. He wanted to hold on to them. He said that they were his. Uh, he wanted to say that there were no documents. Uh, in some cases, like the love letter that is in Trump's own terms from Kim Jong-un, uh, the North Korean leader to Trump, Trump said, that's my property. It was a letter to me. It doesn't belong to the government. Uh, so he had a, you know, a firm view that these were his possessions, that they belonged to him. Uh, that, he's not being prosecuted for violating the Presidential Records Act. That's not what's at issue here. What's at issue is that he had information that if it was out there, could gravely and irreparably damage the national security of the United States. When he was asked to turn it over, he did not. Uh, and ultimately it took a, a search warrant and an FBI search of the former president's property to get all these documents that he and his lawyers had certified had been turned over. Mm. I want to share this news. A spokesperson for the U.S. Marshal Service says that the booking process has been completed for both defendants, former President Donald Trump, as well as his aide, Walt Nauta, who we'll be talking about more today. Let's go to, back to Spencer Shu to talk about why this is happening in Florida, Spencer, because for months, Justice Department prosecutors questioned witnesses before a federal grand jury up here in Washington, D.C., uh, but then we saw this move to Miami. Why? What do we know? Um, the key issue, uh, the word is venue. Um, by the Constitution, statute, and Justice Department uh, prosecutor's manual, a grand jury should work on an investigation where the crime allegedly occurred. Uh, in this case, if the crime was obstruction or conspiracy, Arguably, because the investigation originated in Washington, there could have been a venue, the case could have been brought and charged in Washington, D.C., 
But ultimately, I think Trump's lawyers certainly would have argued, and uh, I think judges would have uh, uh, looked at this question hard, that a lot of the alleged obstructive actions took place at Trump's residence, the Mar-a-Lago uh, private club and home. Uh, and that, uh, you know, you could, I think the prosecution looked at it and said, we could spend a year litigating this, we might lose and then move the case. It would be faster, safer to move the case to, to Florida. You know, it's a quirk that under the law, uh, Florida, uh, the federal uh, court overseeing Florida has a slightly different view. They think that uh, the uh, place where the investigation begins is the place you should charge it. Um, they could arguably uh, raise that um, claim. Um, but it's up to the defense to make that claim and the prosecution judge that uh, Trump's lawyers probably would want to have this case tried in Florida, and that would be the quickest way to a potential trial. Mm. Um, I want to turn to Rhonda Colvin to just talk about what exactly is happening this afternoon, Rhonda. So we know that the booking process has been completed for both Trump and his uh, aide, Walt Nauda. What about the courtroom process? Explain to us what was in store for Donald Trump today. So what has been completed is that processing, that first step, which does involve other little steps. So the fact that they got it done in, what, 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. That was pretty quick. I guess they were, were ready for both uh, the former president and Mr. Nada. Um, but that involves, you know, the fingerprints. That involves also taking a photo, although because this is federal court, we will not see photos. Mm -hmm. There is a, a bit of paperwork, from what I understand, where they have to uh, detail their residence and, you know, closest family members. So there is a, a few steps in that booking process. But they're done with that. Now they're going to go in, in front of the judge. And with this being an arraignment and a first appearance, what that is is uh, letting uh, the defendants know that the, uh, the uh, unsealing has happened uh, and how are they going to plead. So they will be discussing that with the judge. Um, and, and then from there on, we're, we might hear uh, later on, of course, not in real time because our reporters can't have any sort of uh, correspondence with us right now. But we're going to learn what the next steps are. Of course, I, I don't think we've said her name yet, but mm -hmm. Eileen Cannon is the judge in this case. She uh, was appointed, first nominated by President Trump when he was in office. She was one of the last federal judges to be added to the federal bench uh, for Trump. Um, it was days after the uh, November election in 2020 where she was confirmed uh, by the Senate. Um, there have been issues raised about her that potentially she might be biased because she has ruled in favor of Trump previously. Uh, people may not know her name, but you might remember she is the judge who was responsible for the special master in this case. And appointing a special master was because she felt that Trump and his legal team were right that he had executive privilege uh, over these documents. So having a special master slowed some things down for the government uh, to build this case, but another court threw that special master issue out. Um, a lot of people are wondering, is she going to stay on this case? Is, this, is she just going to do this first process and potentially um, say, you know, uh, maybe we need to hand this over to a, another judge or maybe the senior judge in the Southern District weighs in and wants to uh, assign this to somebody else? We don't know that just yet. Uh, but she is an interesting figure uh, because she was a, a Trump appointee. Now he is facing his own appointee. Yeah, and you bring up such an important point because she did make this ruling that was quite favorable to Trump that was ultimately overruled. And so there is that scrutiny. But let's talk about what a magistrate judge does today, James, versus what Judge Cannon would exactly. be doing. So this is not in front of Judge Cannon. This is just someone who's, you know, taking, you know, if someone was arrested for a federal crime on the street, was brought in, was processed, they appear, they're put into the system. Later, there will be motions and trial dates and things that are set. And, and that's where uh, and, Judge Cannon's where Judge decisions Cannon come involved. in so and, crucially, as Rhonda's describing for us. she has enormous influence. Yeah. Assuming that she doesn't recuse, assuming the Justice Department doesn't ask her to recuse, ultimately it is up to her. And why would she, she recuse? Exactly. I mean, and it's essentially, she has no reason to, other than being attacked and mm -hmm. criticized. Uh, you know, she was overruled unanimously by a conservative panel of judges on the 11th Circuit, including two Trump appointees who said this would be kind of an absurd uh, reading of our criminal law. Uh, it, so you could cite that as bias and ask her to recuse. The Justice Department would, would be very, very unlikely to do that uh, uh, with the judge, especially because it would just sort of sour things. Mm -hmm. But what Judge Cannon could do is she could help drag this out. Traditionally, the Southern District of Florida, is con it's called the rocket docket. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they actually have a reputation for moving to a speedy trial, which we heard Jack Smith say he wants last Friday. Uh, they usually can get people trials in like 40, 60 days. They move fast. Uh, but she could drag this out. Uh, she could 
strike down some of the charges. She could she could say, you know, this isn't, uh, uh, you know, these obstruction charges don't work. She could also uh, throw out the Evan Corcoran notes. Mm -hmm. uh, she could say, I disagree with the judge in Washington in this trial. I'm not going to allow this to be presented as evidence because it's a private, it's, it is protected by attorney-client privilege. She could do a lot of things that make the case essentially unwinnable for the government. Uh, and, and, and so it's so fascinating, I want to turn to Spencer on. So Spencer, uh, of course, Jack Smith knew this and his team knew this as they decided venue. Can you talk a little bit more about the risks that they may have been willing to take to move this to South Florida? You know, the, what we hear is that, you know, this is not an option, it wasn't discretionary that Attorney General Garland um, or Justice Department officials in reviewing the final steps and leading this to case, uh, leading this uh, to the charging decision, uh, had a decision and the decision was it's required by the Constitution, it's required by statute. Uh, if the obstructive acts occurred uh, down there, they, they have mm -hmm. to do that. You know, there's a little bit of a luck of the draw element here. There are about 15 judges in the Southern District of Florida, um, but the, and, and judges are chosen at random. Um, there are about a half dozen or handful of judges in the northern part of the Southern District of Florida, which is the name of the federal court uh, district, and, and, and basically they had a, a one in five chance of get, drawing cannon again. So it basically happened twice, once in that search warrant fight that we've talked about um, back in August, um, and then on which, in which she was reversed by an appellate panel, uh, and then again last week. Uh, you know, there doesn't mean that there might not be case uh, charges brought um, still in D.C. where the grand jury had been working for, um, you know, since April. Um, we think that uh, the bulk of the charges and obviously the headline charge of the former president uh, is in Florida. But there's a possibility that people lied to the FBI or um, uh, perjured themselves before the grand jury. Those counts might be charged in D.C. But these would be people who would not be accused of conspiring with the president, not acting with the president, um, but just uh, for whatever reason, perhaps um, uh, uh, being charged with false statements. Since we're talking about uh, Judge Cannon, let's talk about a timeline, Spencer, and what you'll be watching for in terms of decisions that she'll ultimately be making about the timeline. We did hear Special Counsel Jack Smith say, as my colleagues have mentioned, that he, he wants to get this done uh, quickly with fairness to the defendant, but efficiently for justice. What could that actually look like in terms of what Trump may want out of this? Right. So a couple steps. Today, um, the magistrate judge, it's a lower tier judge, may set a, a schedule uh, for the next appearance before the trial judge, Judge Cannon. Or he may leave that to the discretion of, of Judge Cannon. Uh, white collar defense attorneys tell us something like this might be brought in six to nine months. Uh, uh, however, uh, it involves potentially classified information, which could drag out three months, six months, because you need to go um, uh, uh, through the classification review process by agencies. Um, if you're going to submit evidence that is summarized um, without classified information, that takes every agency's review. It takes time to get security clearances for Trump's attorneys, um, and, and, and that will be a process. Um, you know, the, the bottom line is uh, if the government would like to have a trial before the nomination season next summer, that's, that's about one year from now, um, it would take a judge riding herd pretty hard on the circumstances um, and, and the default would be assuming that it couldn't be done in a year. So, so in this case, you know, Trump's attorneys, if their goal presumably is um, to, to not face trial, not risk a, a, you know, a possible conviction or sentence by then. Um, there's lots of ways that, that, that you could do this. You could, um, as, as, as James and uh, Amber have mentioned, you could um, file, uh, y you, could, you could challenge the evidence. You could um, ask the judge to uh, uh, suppress the, the Corcoran's notes of Trump's statements where he was saying, you know, wouldn't it be better if there were no documents or couldn't you just, you know, do this to, to documents as if to pluck them out rather than return them. Um, uh, the, uh, the judge Cannon may be asked, well, you know, it was improper to breach the attorney-client privilege, even if it appeared that Trump's statements were uh, in furtherance of a crime, which is what the judge in D.C. decided. Um, and then there's even the makeup of the jury. And, you know, ultimately, how quickly you come to trial, how quickly uh, his law, you could decide it's too much of a burden on Trump's lawyers to do this while he is facing uh, potentially other charges or campaigning for president. Um, so there's all sorts of ways that the timing could, could, could slow. That's something that I think um, everybody, uh, clearly on the government side and other uh, lawyers, will be watching very closely. Spencer, last question before you. Before 
we let you go, and I, I so appreciate your insights. Let's talk about Walt Nada. This is Trump's valet. He faces six counts for allegedly conspiring with Trump. Tell us more about uh, what he stands accused of and what he faces here in this process. So you, you may have discussed Walt Nada, a young Navy uh, uh, veteran. He was uh, in the military, was appointed to serve as a White House valet. He was essentially a body man, the, the, the person next to the president who, who was helping him, you know, move things, you know, bring him glasses of water, bottles of water, what have you. Uh, after that, he's from Guam initially. After, uh, 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 after Trump left the office, he chose, Walt did, to stay with the president, uh, went with him to Mar-a-Lago. Uh, he uh, was charged with, uh, uh, according to the indictment, Helping bring documents in boxes to President to, to former President Trump, uh, where he was apparently there's text messages saying Walt was aware that uh, Trump was reviewing them, wanted to go through them, wanting to sort through and save some stuff and return other stuff, um, and then returning this first set of 15 boxes to the National Archives that contained, you know, 197 documents. This was back in I think January of 2022. Then there's a second process after the subpoena. Where he, or the, where he takes 64 boxes back to Trump's residence and then uh, moves 30 uh, boxes uh, into the storage room before uh, uh, the government came back and, and uh, was, uh, was going to go through them with uh, uh, Evan Corcoran, Trump's lawyer. And, and what happened was he is charged with, uh, he gave a voluntary interview to the FBI in the presence of counsel in, in that May. And they said, do you, do you know uh, uh, where these boxes have been? Did they ever go to the residence? Where did they come from? How are they stored? And he said, I'm sorry, I just, I just can't help you, or words to that effect. Uh, the government has charged him with, with lying, uh, charged him with concealing from the Corcoran that uh, uh, these boxes were, that they didn't have all the boxes in the storage room. Um, he's charged with conspiracy, charged with obstruction. Those last two are punishable by up to 20 years in prison. Trump faces those same charges. Thank you so much, Spencer Shu. Really appreciate your reporting. James, so if you're Walt Nada and you are getting booked today, as Rhonda talked about, now I do want to say one thing. Typically, there is the photographing, um, but we are waiting to see if that would be done for Trump. It may not be necessary because the point of taking a photo is not supposed to be to sort of humiliate you and get your mug shot, so to speak. It's just so they have an image of you and they know right. what you look like. Um, right. And we all know what Donald Trump looks like. So we'll see exactly how this process works out. But some things will be done for Trump that would not be done for someone normally being booked. Walt Nada is going to get the normal booking. Is that going to be a sobering moment for him, James, in terms of what he faces next because he's not the former president he's not and there's a history of people who worked for donald trump who end up going to jail uh where they get thrown under the bus and they're you know this is someone who's been incredibly loyal to trump uh someone who uh, essentially is in trouble for his loyalty to trump which was professing to uh, not know about uh, the movement of the documents when he had been texting about it and moving the documents uh you know, you look at someone like uh, Michael Cohen, who was Trump's lawyer, uh, a fixer, and ended up in federal prison. Uh, sometimes when you charge a conspiracy like this and you're a prosecutor, you do it to try to flip the lower level person to get the higher level person. Uh, Walt Nada appears to have tied his fortunes to Donald Trump. It's not like Trump can flip on Walt Nada, but I mean, Trump could. Trump's defense could be Nada was doing this, he ran it by me, that somehow he was the one who was uh, kind of orchestrating the movement of the classified material, it wasn't me. Uh, but there is totally a scenario where Trump ends up getting off uh, because you know some juror sides with him and Nada ends up serving hard time. And I'm sure it's incredibly humbling for him because he is someone who served our country in the Navy, who I'm, you know, by all accounts from his friends, considers himself a real patriot. And here he is uh, booked on very serious federal charges uh, that could put him away for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. I want to bring in Leanne Caldwell, co-author of the Washington Post's early 202 newsletter. Uh, Leanne joins us uh, from Capitol Hill. How are lawmakers reacting this morning uh, to this indictment and the appearance in court today, Leanne? So, Libby, it's much of the same. The 
vast majority of Republican lawmakers anyway are trying to talk around this indictment. Uh, they say that uh, there are two tiers of justice in this country, one for everyone else and one for the former president, who they say is, uh, you know, the indictment is extremely political. Um, I just had a long conversation with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy about this, and he really denied uh, addressing the crux of the case here, that it's not about the holding of the documents and the possession of the documents, but the in unwillingness to give those documents back. Instead, they are completely ignoring the central issue and instead saying that this is something that is extremely political, that uh, that uh, they're alleging that President Biden directed the Department of Justice to uh, prosecute his uh, p his political rival in this 2024 election. Of course, the truth is we all know that the reason that uh, Jack Smith, the special counsel, was appointed into this, this situation is because they wanted to take it out of the political process. They wanted to make sure that it was not politicized. And so most Republicans here are saying that uh, they're not necessarily defending Trump's actions here, but they are continuing to say that there are two tiers of justice, and that's an attempt to really confuse people and muddy the waters. Leanne, are you sensing a different reaction to uh, this indictment and these charges from the ones out of New York State um, because of either the gravity of federal charges or because of uh, the great detail that the indictment goes into in terms of Trump's own words, images, messages, his lawyer's notes? I mean, is, is there any hesitancy you're sensing from lawmakers to go too far in defending him until more is learned? So it's almost the exact same playbook. With the first indictment uh, in New York, we saw the same thing, that few Republicans wanted to talk about the substance of the case. They would just say that, you know, Alvin Bragg uh, made a political uh, prosecution or um, political uh, indictment against the former president and saying that uh, he ran on uh, to get his uh, to win his election on going after Donald Trump. And they're making the same exact argument here, not talking about the case. And there's a lot of Republicans who still haven't even read this indictment, Libby. We asked uh, Senator Roger Marshall, of course, he used to work in the, um, I'm sorry, Senator Haggerty of uh, Tennessee, who used to work in the Trump administration as an ambassador to Japan. And you know he was saying the same thing about two tiers of justice. And we asked if he had read the indictment and he said no. And we're hearing that a lot around here. A lot of these Republicans haven't read this indictment. And so there's not much of a difference between the first indictment and, and the lower district of Manhattan and this federal indictment. And so, you know, there's a political calculation here. And off the record and or in private conversations, uh, Republican aides and some Republicans will tell me that the Trump base is just too strong. And, uh, and Donald Trump has done an excellent job of characterizing himself as a victim of a witch hunt and that he is being politically persecuted. And that is uh, seeped into the ether, that seeped into the Republican base, and that's what a lot of these members of Congress who have to face these Republican voters uh, are also the position they are also adopting. And my guest, Leanne Caldwell, is live on Capitol Hill, and she's talking about the reaction of members of Congress. Uh, to give our viewers some sense, sense of this, Leanne, I want to play a little bit of House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and one of the ways that he's chosen to come to Trump's defense in the last couple of days. Let's listen. Was that a good look for the former president to have boxes in a bathroom? I don't know. Is it a good picture to have boxes in a garage that opens up all the time? A bathroom door locks. All right, that's Kevin McCarthy and uh, Leanne Caldwell. What he's referencing there is where, from, where current President Joe Biden kept documents that he got when he was vice president. Yeah, so they're trying to make the comparison that, uh, that Trump has been treated differently from Joe Biden, who also had classified documents uh, from Hillary Clinton. Um, they're not bringing up Mike Pence that much, but they do mention Mike Pence. But the difference, of course, especially between all three of those cases, is that when they found out that there were classified documents in their possession, they turned them in. They gave them back. 
Um, and the reason there was a search for classified documents and for Joe Biden is his lawyers did that search after Donald Trump to ensure that they don't have any classified documents. And so it was a very proactive situation. And again, what Republicans are refusing to acknowledge is the, the matter of the case, the obstruction part of the case about Donald Trump. Um, and so we can hear this. This is going to be a common thread throughout. We'll see as this case, if this case goes to trial, how it plays out. One thing that is interesting, though, that I do want to point out is um, there's a little bit of break in the Senate. Senate uh, Minority Leader Mitch McConnell just spoke to reporters a few moments ago, and he was obviously asked about this, and he refused to talk about it. He didn't mention the name Donald Trump. He says he's going to watch this play out in the justice system. And he said that he would not talk about the politics of it either, um, that there are a lot of candidates in the race and he's going to watch our coverage of how it's covered and that it is covered. So there is some unease among some um, Republicans, but the vast majority are taking this broad defense of the president, or at least I should say, it's not a broad defense of the president, it's an attack against the Justice Department, the FBI, the federal government that plays into these, the, this notion of there being a deep state, something that Donald Trump himself popularized when he was president. Leanne Caldwell, co-author of The Early 202, thank you so much for joining us from Capitol Hill. Rhonda, Leanne, is it a place that you know well? Let's talk about why Mitch McConnell might have a very different reaction to this or a different public statement to this than Kevin McCarthy might. Well, one reason is that Kevin McCarthy, a part of the reason why he is speaker is because he had to make some concession to some of the hardline uh, members of the GOP caucus in the House. So there is this idea that perhaps if he feels beholden, that he does have a group that could slow down legislation, as they did last week. Uh, House GOP members slowed down some legislation because they were upset about the debt limit agreements that McCarthy made uh, with President Biden. Um, he knows that that is a part of his calculation in doing his job as speaker. He's also, you know, been very friendly with Donald Trump. You'll remember Donald Trump used to call him my Kevin. Um, after the 6th, uh, McCarthy did come out and, and say that uh, Trump was wrong in his role, but then he quickly backtracked that and became very supportive of, of Donald Trump. So that is why uh, Kevin McCarthy, in terms of perhaps leadership, is uh, an outlier. But you see the rest of the House GOP, uh, specifically some of the committee leads, like... Uh, 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 Jim Jordan over um, the Judiciary Committee uh, or Comer over oversight. They too are coming to Trump's aid. There is even a, a committee in the House that is called the Weaponization of the Government, where they are uh, hoping to look into anything that looks like corruption, although really nothing has been found, uh, where the government is trying to uh, be hard against conservatives. So. Um, yeah, you're going to see this separate line between how the House Republicans treat this and how Senate Republicans are treating this. I, I'm certainly not surprised with what McConnell has said. Again, my observations have been that Senate Republicans are very carefully choosing their words. They're saying that these are serious charges, but they're also, you know, towing the line a little bit and, and saying, but, you know, some people are, are suspicious of the FBI and the DOJ right now. You are looking at live images from Miami. That is where the former president, Donald Trump, is. He's in a federal courthouse. We know that uh, the booking process is complete. He's now appearing before a magistrate judge as part of this initial court proceeding for the charges against him. The indictment was just unsealed on Friday. Jack Smith, the special counsel, uh, talked to the reporters and to the nation, frankly, James, about uh, just what his office has been up to and what he sees the process will be going forward. Let's drill into these charges a little bit and look at what Donald Trump actually faces in these 37 counts, James. Yeah, 37 counts. The bulk of them are related to the Espionage Act. The 31 counts, it's willful retention of national defense information. Uh, it, it is violating part of the Espionage Act. A conviction does not require any evidence of a desire to disseminate the classified information. Having it in an unauthorized location is enough. Mar-a-Lago, after Trump left the White House, was not an authorized location to store classified information. The next three counts uh, related to withholding or concealing documents in a federal investigation. This is essentially part of the, you know, the, the idea that they were uh, trying to hide information at Mar-a-Lago. Trump and Nada uh, separately face 
uh, one count of concealing evidence with the intent to obstruct an FBI investigation, and then two counts for false statements. This is scheming to deceive the FBI that all the documents had been turned over, uh, signing an attestation, telling your lawyers that there were no more documents. Uh, and then there's the, uh, see at the bottom there, the one count on conspiracy to obstruct justice. Uh, this is also related to Trump specifically being accused of suggesting that one of his attorneys lie to the FBI, saying, you know, why don't you pluck the document out? Why don't you say there are no documents? Now, when you look at this list up here, you wonder, what is the maximum punishment? Each count of unlawful retention of national defense information could be sentenced to up to 10 years in prison. So more than 30 counts there. So more than 30 counts. Uh, and then the, the other charges there at the bottom of our list, conspiracy to obstruct justice, tampering with grand jury evidence, concealing evidence in a federal investigation, all of those carry up to 20 years in prison. Now, it's important to say, and I guess false statement, the last one is mm. up to five years in prison. Trump does not face any mandatory minimums. So if he's convicted, uh, you know, there are examples, David Petraeus, for example, former uh, army general, former CIA director, he shared classified information with his mistress slash biographer. Uh, he ended up getting probation for pleading guilty to that. Uh, you know, it's very, very unusual to sort of stack all these charges on top of each other, obviously it could lead to hundreds of years of jail time, that's misleading. Uh, federal defendants are rarely given the maximum punishment, but the, the, the bottom line is that this is real serious criminal jeopardy. Uh, this is not just a civil suit, this isn't just paying a fine. Uh, this, these are crimes that carry real jail time. You look at someone like Denny Hastert, the former Speaker of the House, uh, he ended up serving years in prison for one count of making a false statement to the FBI, uh, which was about he had, he had paid off uh, a, a man he had allegedly molested. And he didn't go to prison for the molestation. He went to prison for lying to the FBI about the payment. Uh, so these are all serious charges taken together, real criminal jeopardy, which is why his lawyers want him to fight the charges the way you win in court, not the way that you might win in the court of public opinion. Mm -hmm. Let's go back down to Miami where Rich Matthews is outside the courthouse. So, Rich, we know that Trump is inside that building. We're waiting for him to come out at some point. Hey, it's a warm summer day in Miami. How's the crowd holding up? You know, it's uh, even for Miami, it is abnormally hot here. So uh, I think the, the crowd certainly is uh, is overheated, uh, but very few people have left. Uh, very few people left once the president went in. And uh, and yes, you know, we expect him to come out really any minute. Uh, we, we certainly don't expect much of a heads up before that happens. But uh, again, most of the people who are here to kind of protest uh, either for or against former President Trump are still here. Um, there are a lot of people circling this courthouse in cars with flags, honking their horns, cheering, yelling. Um, and when we heard his motorcade arrive, uh, again, there was certainly an extra amount of energy as, as nearly everybody here, media and protesters, uh, tried to get a, a good look at that. You can probably hear right now a, a big tractor trailer is coming down the uh, coming down the road honking its horn uh, and now you can actually see that as well. I will say that on the way to the courthouse on Truth Social, uh, former President Trump actually posted uh, that he was on his way to the witch hunt. Um, and that is rhetoric that we're hearing here at the courthouse from his supporters over and over again. Uh, the, those calls that uh, this is an unfair, unjust uh, prosecution, persecution, if you will. Again, the word witch hunt, I've probably heard 30 times today. Um, and also, again, those, those familiar claims as with uh, President Trump as the victim. Um, you know, just over and over again today, uh, his protesters, when I've talked to him, have said, listen, you know, uh, why not Joe Biden? Why not Hillary Clinton? And again, uh, I I'm a reporter. I'll let the legal analysts uh, weigh in on why. But I will just say that the tone here is, is very uh, anti-Joe Biden, very anti-media. Uh, we've been accused of, you know, again, uh, contributing to this. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, this place is still full of people waiting for the former president to come out of court, which we expect 
any minute. Libby? Thanks so much, Rich Matthews. James, let's talk about why not Hillary Clinton, <laughs> why not Mike Pence, and why not Joe Biden? So they complied. Uh, they opened up their homes, their offices, their storage facilities to federal investigators and admitted that they had this material, turned it over as soon as it was asked for, uh, allowed consensual searches. Trump is not being charged with violating the Presidential Records Act. He's being charged with holding on to classified information after it was uh, asked to be returned. And ultimately, these are government documents, not personal documents. And Rhonda, let's just remind our viewers, we're, we're not talking about like a, a memento or a, a memento, something like this is a letter I got uh, from a world leader about a visit I had. This isn't a, a law that I have, bill that I have passed that is public and shows my signature. Mm -hmm. We're talking about highly sensitive documents. And as the indictment points out, it contains uh, information that could be detrimental to the safety not only of America as a whole, but to America's servicemen and women. That's right, nuclear weapons, uh, military movements. These are highly classified and sensitive materials. And, and to talk about the differences, because I think that's important, because there are a lot of Americans who just see an indictment, may not have read it, and don't realize how serious the charges are. But when you compare it to Biden, Pence, and Hillary, again, like we've said before, it was intent, it was obstruction uh, that are different in those cases and the Trump case. There is How it's been explained to me is there is the idea of what's called spillage in the classified and intelligence communities where, you know, folks who have access to classified documents, there are times where some of these documents go on to, in Hillary's case, a, a, an unclassified server, an email server. Um, it, it spills onto those platforms, and then the FBI and DOJ can assess, was that purposeful? Did the person want to keep those? Did they hide them from us? And in all of those three cases that a lot of people are mentioning and trying to compare to this one, no, that wasn't the case. And it is very clear, at least from the DOJ's point of view, that Trump, when asked, did not give the documents back, when subpoenaed, did not give the documents back. And then uh, with Will, Walt Nada, uh, he did not tell them about the movements of the boxes. That's transcribed, again, in the indictment. So again, it's all about intent, and then it's also about obstruction. And in these other cases, that was not the case that the DOJ arrived to. So uh, Barack Obama famously said, uh, there's classified, and then there's like classified, classified. Mm -hmm. And you know, when, when a vice president like Joe Biden or Mike Pence is traveling overseas, uh, say going to Poland for a trip or something, their schedule is classified uh, before they go. Obviously, you don't want details about their movements uh, going out, but it sort of is moot after the fact because then everyone knows what happened. Uh, we don't, to be sure, precisely know the nature of the documents that Biden had. We know some of the classified material Biden had in his possession dated back to when he was a senator, which he hasn't been since 2008. So it's pretty dated material, uh, and it does get into that spillage idea. With Trump, the accusation is that this is very, very sensitive code word classified material about American vulnerabilities, uh, American war plans, things that, as Libby was just noting, really would put our troops at risk if our adversaries got a hold of them. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about uh, the classified documents, because it's important as we reference these other people who've said, oh, yep, like, Yep, we have these documents and they've been able to recover them. Let's talk about one of the really big points in the indictment, which is the movement of documents and tracing where they were at Mar-a-Lago and how the government's building a case of intention, intention to hide, awareness they were there, and then this question of Walt Nada's involvement with Donald Trump. So if we look at a map of Mar-a-Lago, we'll be able to get a sense of just where the documents are alleged to have been. So there's Mar-a-Lago, it's a bird's eye view. Uh, I want you to start, James, with talking about what Mar-a-Lago is, because it's very key to realize this is not just a man's home and a family's home. It's, a it's also a place where people can go. So there's 150 employees who work there full time. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds of members who pay an annual you know, dues and can basically go anywhere at Mar-a-Lago except for Trump's private quarters. So Trump leaves office in January 2021. They fly down a bunch of these boxes, and initially they put them in the white and gold ballroom. 
we have a, a photo of that there. This is the picture well, I want to show the, the, first, yeah, the, the Trump's the, family suite. I want to show you this first because that's where he lives. Yep. And that gives me a good orientation of where the Trump family lives versus the rest of the Mar-a-Lago club. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and so that really is the only area that's off off limits to people. Obviously, Trump will still have close friends in there, but that's his private quarters. The rest is a, is a club with pool and golf and uh, lots of different uh, things. You know, people uh, can be guests of members and come in. So there you see the photo uh, from the white and gold ballroom. It's an event space. There are weddings in there, that kind of thing. And you can and really tell it's a ballroom. I mean, there's yeah. are literally documents sitting on the stage mm -hmm. of a ballroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's the, the first basically six weeks that Trump uh, is post-president. They kind of they have all these boxes. They're trying to figure out what to do with them. Then in March 2021, they move them to what in the the uh, the indictment is described as the business center. Uh, and then in April, they move the boxes from the business center to the bathroom and shower area. That's what you see in the image on the screen right now. It's so the, let's just stay there already, for a moment. It's already famous. It's famous because there's a chandelier, <laughs> there's a toilet, there's a bunch of boxes. It even has uh, a name. It's called the Lake Room. And, uh, and and so they're sitting there, you know, it's this bathroom people can use. Uh, and at Trump's direction, according to the indictment, in June, they move the boxes from the lake room to a storage room on Mar-a-Lago's ground floor. We have an image of that as well. The storage room, there you see it. That room could be reached through multiple entrances, including a door leading from the pool patio that, according to witnesses, was often kept open. More than 80 document, 80 boxes uh, of documents were kept there, and you can see on the right side of that photo, there's a photocopy machine. Uh, so who knows who got in, who had, a, you know, who rifled through those boxes, uh, it, and none of that is is at issue in the charging document. But it it sort of makes you just it, it is, you know, for people who have handled classified material, it is very very cringeworthy to see that. Uh, and then in November 2021, after repeated inquiries from National Archives officials, Trump allegedly began ordering employees to bring boxes to his private residence, which you were pointing out there yeah, in, in red. Uh, and Trump was allegedly going through them, sort of trying to sort them out. In December of 2021, uh, uh, Walt Nada found several boxes that had fallen in the storage room, and he texted photos to one of his colleagues saying, look, these uh, these boxes have, have spilled open. Those pictures we've seen, uh, and so then they're moving boxes around. In January of last year, they load 15 boxes into Walt's car. Uh, then in May, uh, the FBI comes to interview Walt Nada, uh, and he says he doesn't know anything about moving the boxes around. And then in May of 2022, there's this grand jury that subpoenas Trump and says, do you have any classified documents? You have to turn them over. That's when Trump starts talking to his lawyers. That's when we get into the obstruction part of it. But it's a helpful uh, sort of primer to look. I just want to point out the, this image from the charging documents, yeah. James. So this is not a picture that the feds federal took. officials took. Right. It's a picture. Walt Nada takes this picture on his iPhone and he texts it to someone else who works for Trump and says, oh, well, clearly we didn't do a good job stacking these boxes because they've fallen over on the floor and spilled all over. I'm cleaning it up. Don't worry about it. Uh, and, and that also was taken uh, with Walt Nada's phone and texted around. And then they were able to subpoena these and get these. Uh, so, the, the, yeah, this is not, you know, one of the things that happened early on was after that FBI search in August of 2022, the uh, FBI agents laid out all the classified documents they had found. Uh, and they took a photo that was uh, that became public as part of court right records. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so Trump Trump got very, very angry. And he said, you know, that was a staged photo. I didn't actually keep my documents like that on the floor of my office. Uh, and I, I don't I don't think that that was the suggestion of the court filing. But that was taken by FBI agents who were collecting those materials. Those other pictures we were just looking at were taken by Trump's own aides who were basically communicating uh, with a paper trail about what to do with all these boxes and where to put them, uh, including, we haven't talked about Trump's family members, an unnamed family member, probably Melania Trump, potentially Ivanka Trump, texting with Walt Nada, uh, saying, you know, Trump wants to take some of these boxes on the plane to Bedminster. There's not room because we have all these suitcases. And then Walt Nada responding and saying, you know, he's not planning to take the boxes. He wants to go through them and pull out some information. Uh, so th 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 this is all laid out in detail in this 49-page 
charging document. Let's bring Amber Phillips into the conversation, politics reporter, author of the Five Minute Fix newsletter. Amber, following on this train of thought for a moment, let's get into this question of, of Trump's awareness, um, because some of the information in the indictment uh, is from recordings and conversations that Donald Trump had with people where it seems to show an awareness that he's handling classified documents. Why is that significant? Why is it significant that he sort of reveals that and tips his hand? Yeah, that's a great question, Libby. I, I, and I would argue in the indictment, according to what we know about his comments from the indictment, he's not just aware that he's handling classified documents. He seems to be aware, Libby, that he's mishandling classified documents. Uh, I think back to this moment where he's speaking, according to the indictment, with, with this reporter, and he's waving this document around, going, well, I... You know, I shouldn't be showing you this. I'm paraphrasing here. Another time he's talking to a political political action committee staffer, and he says, step back. You shouldn't be seeing this. And so when the FBI was investigating and, and found out these comments, what we see is the FBI feeling uh, concerned that eventually Trump, through negligence or, or maybe some kind of attempt to get leverage on something, was going to show this to the wrong person, and the wrong people were going to get a hold of it. And all of that is important, going back to Trump's intent, intent, Libby, is because willful, uh, excuse me, let me, let me pull up the statute right here. It says, willful mishandling of the material is what he's charged with. So not sharing the information or giving it to foreign governments or selling it or any other kind of nefarious reason someone might take U.S. secrets, but it's just willful mishandling of the material. And the government has pieced together this this 50-page indictment of him in his own words and in private conversations with his lawyers and other people seeming to know he shouldn't be having these documents in his possession. You know, Rhonda, this is also significant because he had said at one point that he could declassify things like just by thinking it, or mm -hmm. the implication is just because he was the president, he has this ability to declassify sort of retroactively. But that does not match up with what's charged in the indictment in terms of his own awareness of right. his abilities. No, exactly, and we all remember that when that came out, that he said, I could just declassify things by thinking about it. Um, but it doesn't appear to hold water because we know he was aware of the sensitivity of the document. So that, again, is one of those key things to think about when you read it, that he, he, he knew he did not have the power to declassify these things. He appears to know, as the indictment lays out, that these were highly sensitive materials. Uh, and that's one of the reasons he wanted them moved around. And you have to always go back to the fact that he was under subpoena. His team was under subpoena to give back these documents and did not. So again, that's the, the key and central part of a lot of this is had he done that, uh, had he complied with that subpoena, returned everything, Again, we may not be here today reporting on this. And I just have a news to share. Former President Trump has pleaded not guilty. That is his official plea in federal court. James? If you were a prosecutor, Trump basically couldn't make up the, what you're talking about, Rhonda, which is this idea that he outlined a consciousness of guilt. He undercut his own public defenses of pre-declassification. Uh, I mean, this is it, 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 Bill Barr, the former attorney general under Trump, uh, said that if half of this is true, Donald Trump is toast. Now, as Trump pleads not guilty, it's important to say in the American system, you're innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. This is an open trial. Uh, you know, we're obviously not having cameras in there, but uh, there are a lot of countries in the world where uh, these kinds of hearings are closed, and even, uh, especially when it relates to classified information, everything all of a sudden is secret or done in a military court or done behind closed doors. Uh, Donald Trump gets a chance to, to challenge this, to fight it out, to test the government's claims in court. Uh, you know, and it seems from this document that there's a lot of evidence uh, up the government's sleeves, assuming that Judge Cannon allows it to be introduced in court. These audio tapes, these photos, these text messages, uh, the, it, lawyer's the, notes. the lawyer's mm -hmm. notes that you know you really lay it all out there, uh, and uh, you know that that said, he he's innocent until proven guilty. Amber, let's talk about Donald Trump's defense options and how strong or weak they may be. Yeah, Libby, I've been looking at what's filtering up because I want to stress we're not in the courtroom with his lawyers, right? Uh, and and they're not going to start defending him until this case goes to trial 
whenever that might be. Those are the next steps we're all going to watch. But I've been watching, watching filter up uh, from right-wing media and Trump supporters what Donald Trump might say in his defense and come up with two major categories, Libby. And I want to stress that both of them are fairly weak, given everything you and Rhonda and James have outlined that the indictment shows. First one is just simply that he was president. And so therefore, that should be fundamentally different than lower level federal government employees charged with crimes for taking classified documents home. Uh, the argument there is he's just different. He's in a different classification level. Uh, some of these lower level employees, our colleagues Perry Stein has reported, have been sentenced to years, even a decade in prison just for taking documents home. One guy prosecutors framed as just a hoarder who just he, that's where he cut classified documents throughout his 20 years on the job. He's now serving 10 years in prison. Um, but Trump, so Trump, he could argue, hey, I was president, it's just different. Like maybe there was this misunderstanding, for example, that I had these documents because at one point I did have access to them. But again, the giant hole in that argument, Libby, is what we've been talking about all afternoon is that he can't argue he declassified them in mass anymore like he tried to when this investigation was going on because he's on tape admitting that those documents he had he shouldn't have, uh, at least that he didn't have the power to declassify them anymore. And his second defense, uh, main defense that I think had come up is even weaker, and that's that there's no evidence that Trump showed the documents to foreigners or bad guys. Therefore, no problem. It's done. We've heard a lot of Republican allies uh, make this argument on cable news for Donald Trump. But the law doesn't require prosecutors to show Trump had intent to distribute these to, I'm making this up, Russian spies or, or Ukraine or China or anyone else who might come across uh, these documents at Mar-a-Lago. It's just that he, again, willfully mishandled the material. That's what the statute says. And the indictment, prosecutors are well aware that all, that's all they need to do to prove guilt. And they lay out in detail what they think is willful mishandling of material. F the iconic photo of classified document uh, strewn about the floor of a storage room that literally dozens of staffers every day had access to. Amber, I, w I want you to g give us some perspective on sort of the integrity and safety of the chain of... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the chain of custody. Mm -hmm. Give us some perspective on the chain of custody of these boxes and what we know in terms of both who was handling them, but also, as you point out, just how out in the open they were for anyone who was visiting the Mar-a-Lago Club. Yeah, I, I think that's an important question, Libby, because uh, prosecutors really spent this past year or so trying to figure that exactly out. What, who was responsible for these documents? Ultimately, the people they decided to charge were Trump and, and his, his bagman, Walt, Walt Notchua. However, we see in text messages through this indictment that, that there were other aides wondering if they could move boxes from, from an office to a bathroom or a shower or a ballroom so that they could do work. Uh, there were Trump's family members texting, according to the indictment, Walt to ask about whether boxes had been moved at Trump's request to his bedroom on an airplane. And, and so what the indictment lays out is that there was kind of a free-for-all prosecutors feared about who could have their hands on these very secret documents. And some of them were labeled only for specific uh, high-level intelligence people in the U.S. or, or France or Australia or ex-specific countries. Like the, these were not something that anyone in America with a security clearance could see. And so prosecutors feared that it was main, the, the case they lay out, it was, it was Trump and his body man moving these boxes around for a motive we, we still don't yet know or understand, uh, and I don't think prosecutors laid out a motive. And, and then they also laid out this, this concern that where these boxes were was next to uh, where the liquor was at Mar-a-Lago, a pool. CNN had reported a, one of the storage rooms was flooded from the pool uh, because it was right next to it, that there were entrances from the patios at Mar-a-Lago into a storage room or a bathroom, and that just many people had their fingers on these highly classified documents. Amber Phillips, uh, thank you. Stay with us. Rhonda, does it matter to the prosecution if anyone access these documents who should not have. 
a foreign national, a spy, um, someone with political motivations. Is that relevant to the charges? It may not be relevant from a legal standing because it's just the fact that he withheld and willfully withheld these information as well as the documents. So that's what the case is set on. But it is concerning that Mar-a-Lago, back to you know James laying out the geography of Mar-a-Lago, it is extremely accessible um, to people who are not with the government, to people who pay the, the dues to uh, go to the club there. You'll remember uh, back during the Trump administration, there was a woman who was a trespasser there, and she was a Chinese woman, and she was convicted for trespassing and lying to federal agents because there was concern she was a spy. This is a place that you can get into, uh, and that is a concerning part of it, but I would say that's sort of on the periphery. The case itself is that he had documents he shouldn't have, was aware that he had the documents he shouldn't have, and kept them from investigators. Mm. Let's look at some footage from earlier today. This is from CNN showing former President Trump leaving his Doral Golf Club. This is this afternoon as he was on the way to the federal courthouse. He is still, to our knowledge, at that federal courthouse. He's gone through booking today. He is now appearing before a, a magistrate judge. There is Donald Trump heading over there. Uh, James, remind us why he is at Doral and how close it is to the courthouse. So Doral, it's, it's about a 20 to 30 minute drive. Probably normally would be just under 30 minutes. Obviously he had the motorcade. This is one of his properties in Florida. He's called it one of his crown jewels. There's a golf course there that he really likes. Uh, it is uh, very profitable, uh, much larger than Mar-a-Lago. You saw a, a bellhop uh, standing there as Trump walked out. Uh, it is, uh, it, it's, a, it's a resort, not a club. Uh, and it, obviously Trump has uh, the ability to stay there. Uh, it, Ivanka, his daughter, uh, oversaw it for a while when she was working for the Trump organization. Uh, none of the crimes that are alleged took place at Doral. Uh, if he had been at Mar-a-Lago, it would have been just under an hour uh, to motorcade from West Palm Beach uh, down to Miami. Uh, so it's, you know, it, the, both in Southern Florida, as Rich Matthews was telling us a little earlier, it's an unseasonably, even for Miami, hot day in Miami. Uh, and there's a reason that Trump spends almost no time there in the summer. Uh, a lot of wealthy people sort of winter in Florida, and then they spend their summers up in uh, the Northeast. That's what Trump does. That's why he's flying back to Bedminster later today. He didn't fly in until last night. Uh, and uh, Doral is actually in the Miami city limits. Amber, let's talk about what questions have come up as we watch this truly unprecedented moment of a former president being charged with federal crimes. Everything from how quickly uh, a trial could unspool and, and go forward to whether or not Donald Trump could ultimately go to prison. Yeah, Libby, I, a reader for my newsletter, Five Minute Fix, just emailed me and said, can you please, please just tell me if Trump's going to prison and for how long? Can you just call up legal experts and figure that out? And the answer is no, no we, we don't know because, as you point out, Libby, there's so many unknowns before we even get to a sentencing if there were to be one. Next steps, let's start with that. When will the trial be held and where will the trial be held? Uh, Jack Smith, the prosecutor, said, I want this done quickly, but it's not up to him. Uh, it's up to negotiations between the judge, Eileen Cannon, the prosecutor, Jack Smith, and then Trump's legal team. And so I think the first question will be is how long is Trump's legal team going to draw this out? Could they ask to see these classified documents? Our colleagues on the justice team have reported in the Washington Post today that they could try to, to, to um, stop everything up by saying, well, I want to see the evidence, but knowing these lawyers don't have the security clearance to see this evidence because the evidence in this case is highly secret. In all these photos in the indictment, the, the government has redacted those classified documents that were out in the open in the storage room. Uh, the second question is, uh, when this trial will be held and where? Will it be held in Miami? Who's going to be on the jury? Florida has become more of a right-leaning state uh, in, in the recent years. It heavily voted for Trump in, or, relative to a swing state in 2016 and 2020. Uh, our colleagues, again, at the justice, on the justice team have reported that Trump's lawyers could try to get just one person in a jury if this goes to trial to say, I don't know if he's guilty. 
and that could hang the entire trial. Uh, could Trump enter a plea deal? His lawyer, one of his lawyers was on TV this weekend saying he'll never do that, but things could change. Uh, could he suddenly face you know, some kind of deal where he doesn't have to serve time in jail. And then after all of that, Libby, the big question is, will this trial happen before or after the November presidential election? Let's say he wins the nomination and polls show it's still very early, but that he is, has an impressive lead among all the other candidates in the Republican primary. Let's say he wins the nomination. It's him versus Biden. Uh, there's what if there's a trial in October? What if there's a trial in December? What if there's a trial in January and Trump wins the election, could he you, find a way to get the Justice Department to dismiss his entire trial because then he's president? There are just so many mm -hmm. questions leading up to the one that, that one of my readers and I think everyone wants to know mm -hmm. is, is a former president going to go to jail for the first time? Mm. It, it really is hard to wrap your mind around, Rhonda, and it shows both how unprecedented mm -hmm. and dangerous this is in terms of Donald Trump's legal situation, but also how serious these allegations are that the federal government is making. That's right. And I'll add uh, one other element to the what could happen. You can run for president. You can run for Congress in jail. It has happened before. Uh, those who have done that did not win their elections. Uh, but again, we're in unprecedented historic times, as we've been saying. So there is nothing legally stopping the a former president from continuing on uh, in this journey to become president again. Uh, but you do have to look at the calendar. And even if they slow some things down, this still overhangs the 2024 election. It overhangs it for Trump, but also those running for Congress or those Republicans might try to recruit to run for some of these competitive seats, the House seats and the Senate races in 2024. Are there going to be Republicans who want to spend all of their campaign uh, trying to stand with Trump or support him as these trials go on, if there are trials, or as any of these legal issues go on. So this is definitely going to be something that's uh, injected into, you know, the bloodstream of this next race. Mm. Let's go back to Rich Matthews outside the courthouse in Miami. Uh, Rich, we're anticipating Trump's departure from the courthouse soon. What are you seeing where you're at? Well, you know, just a few minutes ago, some heavily armed uh, federal marshals came out and uh, did kind of a patrol around the building. On the back side of the building, the other side is where we expect the motorcade to leave and go, and there is a large crowd. Uh, a lot of the crowd here has actually thinned, but it isn't people going home. They've just moved uh, to the other side of the building, hoping to see uh, former President Trump as he leaves. You know, I do want to jump into the conversation, even though I'm here in Miami. I was listening to Amber uh, speak there and, and you guys talk. And I, I've spent a lot of time this year on the ground in Iowa. And uh, one question that I've asked almost every voter is, you know, could these um, could these allegations, could these indictments change your opinion? And overwhelmingly, the answer from, from potential voters who already support President Trump, the answer is no. Um, I mean, it, it, you know, again, it is an interesting time. It's an unprecedented time. Will, will some of these allegations, indictments here in New York, uh, will those affect voters? I really don't think so, because the people who already uh, are opposed to President Trump uh, being reelected, uh, they feel that way, and his supporters are so fervent, so strong um, in their will that, that, again, I really don't know that, that these things will matter. So while certainly it's impossible and would be even foolish for us to ignore the politics that are involved in this, um, it's just so tough, Libby, to predict them, right? It's so tough to predict the impact that this type of thing uh, will have on the upcoming election. Uh, so again, we do expect the president, uh, President Trump, to be leaving any minute here. Uh, security has been stepped up outside the courthouse. Again, all day there's been a lot of security, but uh, there's an extra layer right now outside the courthouse preparing uh, for his imminent departure. Libby. You know, Rich, I'll be curious to see if any of those Trump supporters were able to get seats in the courtroom and what their reflections are, because as our team has pointed out, this is a, a public process. It's just that there aren't cameras allowed in, there's not photos taken, and uh, we don't have a broadcast audio 
a recording of what's happening, but people can get inside. Um, what were you hearing from people, the protesters, the Trump supporters gathered today about what they wanted out of this day? Well, I'll tell you that the overwhelming majority of people in that line, and, and there was a long line this morning. There was a long line overnight. But the overwhelming majority of the people who made it inside the courthouse were journalists. Um, and again, uh, like happens, uh, you know, even for good theater tickets in New York. Uh, I mean, look, this is a show, right? This is this is something that people want to be a part of and they want to see. Uh, there were people that paid others to stand in line for them overnight. And uh, I would say it was probably around 8.30, 9 o'clock this morning that they opened the doors and let those people in. Now, because I'm out here, Libby, I don't have the answer to your question about how many even of those people made it all the way into the courtroom. But again, there were uh, at least maybe 100 people that were allowed inside, and uh, they'll be doing their reporting. But as you pointed out, can't take a phone in, uh, can't take a single picture, you know, with anything. Um, we're in a tent uh, with Associated Press reporters right now, and just behind me there's a gentleman holding five, uh, five phones for the reporters that are inside. We have our phones for the Washington Post reporters who are inside. Um, and again, any minute, uh, President Trump will come out and so will all those reporters, and then, for the first time, we'll know what happened. Libby? Rich Matthews reporting live outside the federal courthouse. Amber, uh, let's talk about public opinion on the Trump indictment and what this could mean in terms of the politics of 2024. Yeah, great question, Libby, and I think it's important to build off Rich's uh, smart reporting, uh, asking people in Iowa, what's going to change if your candidate is under indictment while he's running? Uh, the polls bear out what Rich is hearing on the ground from voters. So Trump got indicted on fr Friday. The indictment was unsealed. Over the weekend, two big news organizations were already conducting polls about the presidential race, ABC and CBS, so they tacked on questions, what does this mean for Trump's indictment? Er, and um, what CBS found in particular was that Americans are split uh, whether the charges of hiding classified documents represent a national security risk or they're politically motivated. And in addition, 23% uh, of Americans said, I, I kind of think it's both. So when you add that up, you have like more than 60% of Americans, according to the CBS poll, who feel that at least on some degree, these charges laid out very clearly with Trump's own statements, security camera footage, witnesses, photos, uh, that these charges are actually politically motivated. And I think that lends uh, an opening for Trump and his team to at least try to fight these charges in the court of public opinion. Uh, in addition, those polls showed Trump's lead over Ron DeSantis and his other competitors gaining. He's up in some polls by an average of 30 percentage points. Uh, it's going to be, if, if the election were held today and it's not, it would be very hard for anyone to overtake him. And that's happening at arguably his weakest moment legally when he when he's facing a serious uh, indictment and, and what other Republicans have said are serious charges. You know, Rhonda, what that polling information shows us is that Republicans have an obvious path to walk, which is attacking the process, as you told us about, and they can maybe ignore the substance of the charges a little bit and they can focus on this quote unquote political motivation. I mean, it does show you why they'd be taking that, frankly, safer route. Because as the evidence is revealed and people learn more about what exactly Donald Trump is alleged to have done, that might be harder to defend over time. And I would also like to make this point, too. I've been waiting to jump in on this one. <laughs> the CBS poll was the respondents were likely GOP primary voters. So we probably need to make that distinction, too, that primary voters are usually very enthusiastic about their party. They will turn out during the primary season. Uh, but is this sampling the same as Republicans in a general election, if it was Trump versus Biden or uh, you know, Trump versus whomever. We, we know that no one's challenging President Biden. But I think that's an important thing to think about because this may not be all Republican voters. And I'm thinking back to the midterm elections when, when we were reporting in the primary season of midterms, 
it looked like Trump was a kingmaker in some states like Ohio or other places where he was giving endorsements. But we also saw that the Republicans did not get as many seats as they thought they would in the House. So the primary elections and those who vote in that are usually very enthusiastic. But when you get to the final match, sometimes things change. So I just want to want to point out that it, it could be a different sampling of people. If you were to just call up every American and say, does this indictment matter to you, you might be getting a different reaction than just asking enthusiastic GOP primary voters. And indeed, uh, there was the CBS YouGov poll we've been talking about, and you're absolutely right. But there's also an ABC Ipsos poll that really zeroed in on independent voters, mm -hmm. uh, and, and including, you know, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of kind of Republican-leaning independents, uh, center-right folks, uh, who maybe voted for Trump in 2016, but didn't vote for him in 2020. And while the primary numbers are, are what they are, and it matters, uh, more than 60% of independents were troubled uh, by these developments and said that it would make them less likely to vote for Trump. So those swing voters, to the extent that there are some left in American politics, they might be turned off by this. Ultimately, too, putting aside the legal jeopardy and everything we're talking about, it gets at this idea of judgment and, you know, the, the, just the breathtaking recklessness of leaving these documents out. At some point, does that cast doubt, not on the, you know, Trump versus the government and the Justice Department, but just sort of, is this the guy? Yeah, is this the person that, you, you know, that you really want? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, it's ironic after 2016, when Trump made Hillary Clinton's handling of uh, classified material so central to his pitch, mm -hmm. uh, that this could then ultimately cloud his uh, third candidacy for the presidency. You know, Amber, Rhonda talked about Donald Trump's role as kingmaker, but we also saw some disastrous results for some of the candidates that he endorsed in the recent midterms. And when we talk about how Mitch McConnell is responding to his indictment and this news, no love lost between those two after January 6th, but also after Donald Trump's endorsements didn't do nearly as well as Republicans had an opportunity to in the midterms. Yeah, I think that's right. And let me say real quickly, Libby, this, the CBS uh, poll data I cited on whether Republican, excuse me, whether people thought the charges were politically motivated, that particular section was actually all Americans. But, mm. but the question about where Trump stands in the primary race, Rhonda's absolutely right, it's GOP primary voters. And um, it's very interesting, Libby, you talk about the Senate minority leader, Mitch McConnell. We don't hear him talking. Uh, I, I, James might correct me, but I don't, I don't believe he's spoken at all since the indictment has come he out. Not. Well, he, ta he, he talked at the, at the he, clock today. Yeah, 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 oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, it'd be hot off the presses. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> at he's the Ohio clock, right. yeah, yeah, today. But, but he's certainly not giving a ringing endorsement of right. Donald Trump and no. a big defense of him, Rhonda. No, he, he's not. And he had to face those questions. Typically, you know, senators go to what's called the Ohio clock on Tuesdays. They also go throughout the hallways in the Capitol on Tuesdays after they have lunch with their caucuses. And he was asked by this because this is the big news for everybody right now. Uh, and, and he's matching the attitude we've seen some, from other Republicans uh, in the Senate who uh, say these are serious charges. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's but, not a full-throated defense right, by any isn't. stretch of the but imagination. He, he did not, so Amber, totally to your right, point, Amber, he did not yes. come out on his own. He was asked by reporters yeah. to comment on this. Yeah. Um, and Amber, why is that significant? Yeah, because Senate Republicans are trying to get back the Senate. Yeah in 2024. That, that is a huge goal that they have. Uh, and they blame Donald Trump. Senate leaders blame Donald Trump and his support, particularly of election deniers last midterm election, for them not having the Senate right now. And so I think it's very interesting to see these indictments further cleave the party, even, mm. even if they're being kind of incons inconspicuous about it. And Mitch McConnell and the Senate's number two, John Thune, I saw, were talking about how, well, these charges are serious. Maybe it's politically motivated. I don't know. But, so they're being kind of inconspicuous about it, but they're not embracing Trump. And so there, there's this, these indictments, I feel like, are finding the cracks in the Republican Party mm -hmm. that are already pretty large and cleaving it even more. Um, and, it, and it makes me wonder if Trump is the nominee, how they're going to be able to work together next year to win the White House, win, keep the House, and win the Senate. That's, that's Republicans' ultimate goal. And, and there are Republicans here in D.C. who feel like they have a chance if they don't have Donald Trump as their nominee and, and the party is able to rid itself of election-denying candidates. Um, 
that's not reality right now for Republicans, though. Donald Trump is leading in the polls. There are the election deniers who want to run for Senate again. Uh, and, and that has Republican leaders in Washington concerned. Great questions, great points, Amber. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. You know, James, there will be this question, and we'll see, we'll have to wait and see how the evidence bears out about can Americans, if they do see this as politically motivated, still become turned off by Donald Trump for the very questions you mentioned, decision making, sort of the, the maelstrom of chaos that surrounds him, and then also how he's responding to these charges. What will you be watching for? You know, I'm going to be watching for the degree to which Republicans start to criticize him more vocally. It's one thing for Mitch McConnell to be uh, muted. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the Republican presidential candidates seem to be doing what they did in 2015 and 2016, which was assuming that other Republicans would go after Trump for them and that, you know, he would collapse. Uh, the reality is that he is the front runner for the Republican nomination. And we have a you know, the first Republican presidential debate coming up in August. We have various court appearances. We've seen people like Nikki Haley start to change her tune a little bit, even over the last couple of days. Uh, the, the people who most frontally go at Trump, uh, you know, someone like Asa Hutchinson, the former governor of Arkansas, he's exceedingly unlikely to be the Republican nominee because this is Donald Trump's Republican Party. Our colleague Aaron Blake is sharing that Nikki Haley is saying that while, quote, Trump may have been, this is the quote part, incredibly re reckless with our national security, uh, she would also probably pardon him for that, Rhonda. Mm -hmm. So you see them calculating in real time, trying to figure out, you know, sort yeah, of where the wind is blowing, them. which <laughs> I'll say this on this side and that on that side and, and figure it out later. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. We also heard uh, Tim Scott yesterday uh, also say that, that line about these are serious charges. Mm. Um, I think it remains to be seen, and it's going to be a very important point as we move along, either in this case or maybe the forthcoming ones, how Republicans on the Hill, as well as those running against him, categorize all of this. This one particularly, because it's, these are federal charges. I think when we were talking about polls back in the Manhattan case, a lot of people felt that that was a personal matter. It dealt with a mistress. This deals with classified documents that, if in the wrong hands, could harm us all. So you wonder if the tone is going to change at all as we move forward, and if there is a third indictment when we're, we're looking at Fulton County, Georgia, and, and what happens there. So how are folks like Nikki Haley going to argue these points for Trump, but yet also say they want to lead the country? So when we get to this question of how successful the prosecution's case will be, will they be able to convince a jury uh, in South Florida uh, that Donald Trump is guilty of one of 37, up to 37 charges? Let's hear what William Barr has had to say about this. Of course, the former U.S. Attorney General who served under Donald Trump, he said Trump is toast if the indictment is true. Let's listen. If even half of it is true, then he's toast. I mean, it's a it's a pretty it's a very detailed indictment, uh, and it's very very damning. And this idea of presenting Trump as a victim here, a victim of a witch hunt, uh, is ridiculous. He was totally wrong uh, that he had the right to have those documents. Those documents are among the most sensitive secrets that the country has. He. They have to be in the custody of the archivist. He had no right to maintain them and ret retain them. And he kept them uh, in a way uh, at Mar-a-Lago that anyone who really cares about national security, would, their stomach would churn at it. It's William Barr, former attorney general under Donald Trump. James, I mean, when do other Republicans take that perspective as well? I think privately a ton of them feel this way. Mm -hmm. Bill Barr's not going to be on any ballot. He's not running for re-election. Amber was talking about, you know, all the, the people who are kind of moderate Republicans and turned off by Trump. But there is a huge number of hardcore Trump voters who weren't involved in the political process before 2016 and 2020, especially in a state like Florida, that all of a sudden has turned from very purple to very to kind of red. Uh, and Trump has brought these people into the political process who may not stay in the political process mm -hmm. if Trump's not the nominee, if he's not the standard bearer. They may not move to a Ron DeSantis in a general election. Obviously, DeSantis is trying to win over those voters, uh, but the, the, 
you know, obviously Bill Barr is a Trump appointee. He has so much credibility with establishment Republicans, but it does sort of feel like there's a huge part of the Republican Party that is tuned out. Even, you know, Bill Barr, John Bolton, uh, people, you know, who we would have 10 years ago thought, well, these people are the most credible voices that you could possibly have among Republican primary voters. Credible in the eyes of these Republican voters and very conservative, Republican, mm -hmm. like capital R, right. lowercase r, exactly. all the R's, right, yeah, right. Capital C. Right. Yeah, and, and so, yeah, and, yeah. And that's, and, and that's, I mean, I do think that it is, you could have like a death by a thousand mm -hmm. cuts scenario. I do think that there is exhaustion. One of the novel arguments that Ron DeSantis is making now on the stunt that actually seems to be resonating with grassroots voters I'm talking to is that he could serve two Trumps, two two terms while Trump could only serve one. Uh, and because that he Trump's could get, already because served he already term, served a so term. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, so there are arguments that are being mm -hmm. made and against age Trump. As well. age, I've heard that recently. And, yeah. You know, the, and, and also just the, uh, ultimately, if, it, it's remarkable that this might actually be more potent, but electability, if Republican voters who like Donald Trump conclude that he can't beat Joe Biden, that could hurt him more than if Republican voters conclude that he uh, recklessly uh, cavalierly handled national security material. Mm -hmm. Let's look again at the charges that Donald Trump faces. I'm, I'm gonna get out the charging documents here and look them over as we read these Counts, 31 counts of willful retention of national defense information. James, they each carry 10 years, 10 years each on each count, maximum mm -hmm. sentence. Then we also see three counts of withholding or concealing documents in a federal investigation, two counts of false statements, and one count conspiracy to obstruct justice. That last count is five years, but the other ones, five of the counts carry a maximum of 20 years. Now, it's important to point out that those aren't typically served concurrently. It's not one after the other, and rarely would someone get the max, but it does go to show the gravity of the charges. Rhonda, as you read this indictment, I mean, it really does read like a story in a lot of ways because they are recreating scenarios and talking about moments, and they've got witnesses, they've got photographs, they've got information from the people who were close in Donald Trump's inner circle. Can you characterize it more for us? Yeah, it's highly readable. And you'll remember on Friday when Jack Smith came to the microphones just for about two minutes, he said he wanted Americans to read it. It, it, it reads as you don't need a, a legal degree or, or any special degree to understand it. It is chronological. It tells you what happened. And it's somewhat very simple. Um, and it is it feels like it is designed for the public to come to their own conclusion. I think one thing that stood out to me is when you look at the transcriptions and the text messages involving Walt Nada, um, you see someone that perhaps some of these investigators want to potentially press to see if he might turn or provide information uh, that that might help them in their case on uh, against Trump alone. He also we just went through the charges against uh, Trump. But he's facing six uh, counts as well, and that's dozens of years in federal prison. So you, there are pictures of Walt Nutter there. Right. On the you have to wonder is he going to be pressed to potentially turn on the former president? I don't know if we have indication yet mm -hmm. that that's possible because we did see him over the weekend and today. Um, and today. So it does not appear as if he is going to just go his own way. But you wonder as this goes on, and he's about 40 years old, 41. Um, you know, if he were to serve some of the maximum on his counts, he could be in jail until the 60s. So are, you know, some of the, the DOJ folks going to try to press him uh, like they've done with some of the other people in the Trump orbit to, you know, go up against Trump? And are other Trump aides charged? The indictment lays out unnamed, you know, Trump aide one, Trump aide two, uh, the people that Nada was texting with about moving the boxes. Maybe they didn't give an interview to the FBI and they don't have the same kind of obstruction issues. But there are other people in Trump's orbit who face potentially serious criminal jeopardy and perhaps uh, prosecutors could try to flip them uh, before bringing charges. Uh, but, you know, Donald Trump has a way of, of you know, uh, keeping a very tight knit circle and uh, and and also some of these attorneys uh, who potentially face legal jeopardy. NAGA, the joke in the Trump world now is make attorneys get attorneys uh, because they've had to hire their own counsel to represent them. And that's one of the reasons it's been so hard for Trump to find counsel here in Florida to defend him. Let's talk about the lawyers central to this case. Uh, for people who haven't heard part of this conversation earlier, James, talk to us um, about 
how prosecutors were able to get access to Trump's conversations and really his directives to his former lawyer. Yeah, so uh, Evan Corcoran was part of Trump's legal team, uh, still is part of Trump's legal team. He's recused himself on the documents part. He's representing him uh, as the grand jury investigates January 6th and the fraudulent, the phony fake, you know, the slate of electors that said Trump won the election, still uh, on his legal team. Uh, Evan Corcoran essentially took detailed notes. He recorded voice memos on his phone that translated into text after his meetings right after with Trump and said Trump said, you know, maybe we can make the documents go away. Trump sort of made a motion about plucking bad documents and taking them out. Wait, slow down uh, and tell people yeah. that story because if they yeah. haven't read the charging yeah, yeah, yeah. documents, so the, they may not know about this. Totally. Thank mm -hmm. you for that. Um, so the government subpoenas documents. Evan Corcoran goes to Mar-a-Lago and he essentially signs uh, because Trump told him to. Uh, Trump said, no, I've turned over everything I've got. He signs an affidavit, a sworn affidavit saying, uh, we've turned everything over, we've complied with this subpoena. And uh, one of the things that Trump's accused of is, is part of the obstruction of justice is hiding some of these documents from his own lawyer because the lawyer uh, is, is an officer of the court and is attesting that the documents have been turned over. And so uh, because attorney-client privilege would normally protect this information, there is an exception uh, called the crime fraud exception. And if, if you're, you know, if you just have someone who you're calling your lawyer who has a law degree and you're conspiring with them to do illegal activities, obviously your communications with them are, are, shouldn't be protected. Uh, and so Beryl Howell, a judge in U.S. District Court here in D.C., said uh, the crime fraud exception applies and Evan Corcoran's private notes to himself about what Trump was telling him need to be turned over to federal investigators. Those are cited, quoted uh, in the charging document. Not all of Evan Corcoran's personal messages were turned over. Uh, some of what Evan Corcoran was outlining to himself about potential legal defenses, like Trump could argue this, he could try this. That stuff wasn't turned over because it wasn't related to the obstruction charge. Uh, so today, Todd Blanche was speaking for Trump in the courtroom. He's the one who announced to the court that we're definitely going to plead no, not guilty to these charges. Todd Blanche came into Trump's legal orbit just a few months ago uh, as part of this Manhattan case. He's, he's the guy who defended Paul Manafort, mm -hmm. Trump's 2016 campaign chairman, over money laundering charges uh, for not paying taxes related to his work in Ukraine for the pro-Russian government. Uh, Blanche uh, started representing Trump in the Manhattan case related to Stormy Daniels, and Trump has basically promoted him and said, you're doing a good job. I want you to also represent me in this federal case. This isn't normally an area where uh, Blanche practices, but this is Trump feeling like he has a good advocate. Uh, and yesterday afternoon, after he landed in Miami, Trump was interviewing local Florida defense attorneys who could be part of the legal team to sort of build the pool. Uh, the, the, these lawyers are pretty stretched thin. You know, Rhonda was talking about all the different other cases that are pending. Mm. Um, I want to talk to you about the New York case yeah. for a moment, because we've been talking about this federal case. We've been talking about the challenges yeah. that Trump's lawyers are going to be faced with now. But his legal team is spanning multiple venues now because his legal team is also dealing with the charges in New York, which we saw in a lower Manhattan uh, courtroom in early April. And this was huge breaking news in late March, early April news that for the first time ever, a former president would be indicted, not on federal charges like this time, uh, but in the Manhattan courtroom. And this was a huge deal at the time, still a huge deal, because we're watching to see just, one char just what uh, Trump's legal defense will be. I, I want to point out there we can see part of that motorcade and the police escort and the uh, the team that was there getting Trump safely and also watching the uh, the security footprint on the ground. While we look at that, let's talk about what Trump faces in New York and why. Interestingly, if Trump became president again, he could theoretically it's debatable, but he could pardon himself for the federal charges. He could not pardon himself for these local charges mm -hmm. uh, that the Manhattan District Attorney has brought. These essentially accuse him of committing business fraud, uh, of, of using uh, business money to pay off this adult entertainer uh, to not talk about their alleged affair before the 2016 election and essentially 
using business money to pay campaign expenses mm -hmm. and then trying to cover it up and uh, orchestrate a scheme, uh, you know, th that is, uh, is essentially corporate fraud. Uh, and, you know, that, that's, a, that's actually a statute, Rhonda, that's, you know, as you know, often used in New York uh, and it's separate and distinct from the New York Attorney General, Letitia James, who also is investigating the Trump Organization and potential tax fraud that Trump committed uh, by basically overstating the value of certain assets to get loans, by underpaying taxes, understating the value of assets when the, the tax man cometh. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the, this, you've mentioned the Fannie Willis case. Mm -hmm. uh, she has basically uh, telegraphed that if you want to jump in, that yeah, you know yeah. she's telegraphed that in August they're going to bring charges. We don't know against Trump, but probably. In, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In August we're expecting uh, some news out of Fulton County. Uh, of course, that's looking at whether or not Trump interfered in the 2020 election when it came to Georgia and their sovereign ability to run an election, their state election. Uh, we all remember that phone call where he uh, asked the Secretary of State to find a certain number of votes uh, just so that he could win. Uh, and we now know, according to some of the, the members of the grand jury, that there should be some uh, pretty explosive things coming out uh, if that grand jury does uh, serve up an, an indictment. Uh, what we have seen from Fannie Willis is she is asking uh, the judges in that district to not uh, schedule any hearings or trials in those first two weeks of August. That is thought uh, to allow people to be able to work from home because there are security concerns if she brings this case in those first two weeks. So it does seem as if she's in a posture to, to bring this uh, potential indictment uh, for potential uh, interference in the 2020 election uh, from Fulton County in the early part of August. So that's something that we are certainly keeping a close eye on and that it just adds another layer to you know, all of this. What's interesting is we, we saw tape a few minutes ago uh, of Trump speaking this weekend at the Georgia Republican Party convention. Our colleague Amy Gardner was there. It took place in Columbus, Georgia, right on the border of Alabama, uh, in a former Confederate munitions depot that's been turned into a convention center. And it, it really illustrated how much Trump has taken over the Republican Party. Brad Raffensperger, not invited. Yeah. Uh, Brian Kemp didn't show up. Uh, neither did the Republican Attorney General. The outgoing Republican Party chairman is potentially going to be one of the people indicted in August by Fannie Willis because he was one of the fake electors uh, and he was defiant about it. He bragged about it. He got standing ovations for it. Uh, he introduced Trump on Saturday at their convention. Uh, and more than half of the delegates to the Republican state convention in Georgia were never involved in Republican politics before 2020. These are people who come into the system because of Trump and they you know, overwhelmingly believe that the election was stolen, which there's not evidence to support. And they're on Trump. You know, they're on Team Trump. This is, the, again, as you were pointing out earlier, Rhonda, the Republican Party apparatus, which is very different than most rank and file voters in the Atlanta suburbs, who I think are deeply uncomfortable with everything that's going on. And this is all happening, a, a potential trial in Georgia against the backdrop of Georgia was you know, decided by 10,000 votes in 2020. It's going to be like the, you know, A or the battleground in 2024, either Georgia, Arizona, Wisconsin, those are likely to be kind of ground zero again. And now we could have another situation where we're back here again in August uh, talking about a trial in a pivotal swing state mm -hmm. and more legal jeopardy for Donald Trump. That's right. And one of the things to explain uh, why Fannie Willis is uh, concerned about uh, workers being there and their safety mm -hmm. You'll remember that Georgia was the site uh, of some uh, pretty intense protests when it came to yeah. the counting of ballots uh, back in uh, 2020, the recounts, the right. audits, uh, where they did have individuals who were threatening election workers. You remember when we covered the January 6th sure. hearings, how there was a poll worker who talked about how she uh, no longer likes to order pizza because people have her name and she's afraid uh, to live her life because of the threats against her on behalf of Trump. Yeah. So. Security is, is a real concern, as we're seeing play out here on yeah. the screen, where we're seeing, uh, you know, the local uh, law enforcement, federal law enforcement all come together uh, and try to protect people at this moment, something we also saw in Manhattan as well. It is reportable now that court has concluded. 
So we are watching to see Donald Trump come out of court. Our reporters who've been in the court will be able to come out and share with the Washington Post and us and the rest of the world exactly what's been going on in this courtroom. James, you said something so notable earlier that this is a public trial process. I want you to talk more about that. Yeah, just because we don't have a live camera feed from inside the courtroom, <laughs> uh, which obviously I think those of us, you know, every, probably everyone watching would love to have, uh, although that makes it more of a circus. You know, this is a serious matter. This is sedate. Uh, this is an open trial. It's not closed. It's not, uh, you know, I, um, just hypothetical, or not hypothetical, but for a, a counterexample, point of comparison, Pakistan right now, uh, they have arrested their former president. They've charged him with different crimes. There's been lots of violence. All of that is happening before military courts, and the proceedings are secret. People aren't allowed in. Uh, they're not, you know, they're they don't have the same rule of law that we have. And people obviously are saying it's unfair for the former president to be targeted. But ultimately, this is a test of whether no one is above the law in the United States. Jack Smith, in his speech on Friday, said, no, you have to you have to charge, or if you don't charge crimes, then you're allowed to commit them. And uh, Donald Trump gets his day in court. He gets the chance to challenge uh, the government's case. He gets the chance to uh, sit in and watch people testify against him and to question them. Uh, and challenge them, and reporters are allowed in. I mean, th these things we take for granted, uh, but are very much uh, unique to the American system. As we watch the federal courthouse in Miami, let's bring in White House Bureau Chief Tolu Olurunipa. Tolu, welcome. Thank you for joining us. You, you know, the attack and um, allegation that some Republicans are making is that this is uh, a witch hunt, this is misuse of this, the power of uh, the Justice Department and prosecutors, and that this is Joe Biden going after a top political opponent. So how is the White House handling this and viewing this? Uh, they are uh, taking a very hands-off approach, at least publicly. They are not commenting on this. They do not want to allow Republicans to link them to this case and make it seem as if Joe Biden himself is behind this prosecution. So every time the president is asked about this, he declines to comment. Whenever his aides are asked about this, they say that they refer everything to the Justice Department, that the Justice Department is independent, and they do not want to be involved at all in this. Uh, and now we did see a, a little piercing of that strategy when the First Lady uh, was at a fundraiser yesterday in which she was uh, willing to sort of put her toes in the water a little bit and say that she was surprised that so many Republicans still were standing by Trump even after this indictment. And so that was the first time we saw anyone connected to the White House really kind of weigh in on this case in a, in a somewhat substantial way. But the broader approach of this White House has been to say, we are going to let the Justice Department be independent. We're not going to get linked into this case. And we're not going to allow Republicans to make it seem as if we are the ones prosecuting Trump. If Trump goes down, it's going to be on his own accord uh, because of uh, the way the legal the, department, the way the Justice Department is supposed to work, the way the legal system in this country is supposed to work, which is not because the president determines someone is going to be prosecuted, but because uh, independent investigators, independent prosecutors determined that uh, these charges were necessary and the president was hands off. And they said that they learned about this at the White House at the same time everyone else learned about this. We're watching former President Trump's motorcade leave the courthouse in Miami, leave that uh, garage area. You can hear his supporters chanting out there. And as we've been talking about, this motorcade is really Tulu. It really has the footprint of a classic presidential motorcade, even having the ambulance at the back of the motorcade just in case of an emergency. Um, let's talk to Lou about the optics of this moment, seeing the Secret Service do this job to protect a former president. He's a former president, but he still has a lot of the accoutrements of the presidency, and that's at the heart of this case. He is a former president. He is not a current president, even though in many ways he tried to continue to behave as if he was a current president, holding court at Mar-a-Lago, having people come in and see him, having members of Congress come in and, and I, uh, Tolu, see him. I just have to interrupt you for a moment. So it, one of the protesters ran in front of the motorcade. It looked like I think it's someone, as we heard from Rich Matthews earlier, who might be anti-Trump. He had a sort of a stereotypical jail uniform on. Stay with us, Tolu, for a moment as we bring in Rich Matthews. I'm sorry to cut you off, Tolu. Um, Rich Matthews, can you describe the scene there outside the courthouse? 
Well, uh, you know, again, I used that word circus earlier today, and, and it certainly applies right now. Um, you know, we've obviously been watching for the last five minutes or so. It, it really started when we saw the reporters start filing out, uh, the, the reporters start running out um, of the courtroom. Okay. Just Mike, for a moment, we're just watching um, an individual who's being detained. Obviously, he ran out in front of one of the SUVs of the motorcade, and so uh, it looks like city police have detained him. And there was what appeared to be a Trump supporter who uh, sort of trying to hit him, tried to slug mm -hmm. him, and mm -hmm. uh, police intervening uh, and having to pin him down and arrest him. Uh, what officials, what law enforcement is trying to avoid is a powder keg. And there's awareness that there might be, quote unquote, both sides, supporters of Donald Trump and people who were opposed to him. Uh, and so one of the goals here is this woman tries to kick that man, is to try to tamp down this energy and make sure that there's not personal vengeance taken, this is not vigilante justice, that the law enforcement is there to handle the situation. And this is why you have a really large police presence yeah, and you also have to wonder, we were talking earlier about where do these people go after it's all over. There is concern that this just doesn't dissolve now that Trump is left. Um, and there could dissolve be clash. Into, like devolve into chaos. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Or that it doesn't evaporate. Okay. Like the people okay. are going to remain there. Mm -hmm. If there are people from both sides, mm -hmm. you could imagine uh, that passions and tensions could run high. Um, and and it, it feels, again, we covered the Manhattan case. Uh, we did not see this type of crowd. I know Rich can talk to that. It seems that the crowd has grown over time uh, and is in a different parts of that area as well. Uh, so the, the law enforcement there has their, their work cut out for them. What, what's scary too? What's, I, yeah, ahead, no, James, I mean, what's scary please. too is that you know this, these, this is a crowd that has not gone through magnetometers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you could have sort of anarchists here who aren't really pro-Trump or anti-Trump, but just, just want chaos and just taking yeah. advantage of the situation. I want to go back to Rich Matthews. Sorry to cut you off, Rich. What we were seeing there was uh, a protester threw him, like tried to run him between the motorcade cars, and he was grabbed by police. And then, as he appeared to be anti-Trump, some of the Pro-Trump supporters were kind of trying to kick him or push him or slug him even. Um, so, Rich, give us a sense of what's on the ground in the area that you're seeing. Well, you know, that's the same gentleman that uh, did the same thing on the way into court. Um, so, uh, same guy that we did talk about earlier. And he's been out here all day. He was actually out at Doral yesterday. And uh, that's not the first time that he's been in uh, what I would call a skirmish. Um, you know, again, uh, as you mentioned, Libby, the, the crowd has grown throughout the day, certainly at its largest in the last hour or so. Um, a lot of the people, though, have moved to the other side of the building, which is where the president uh, pulled out uh, just a few moments ago. What I was uh, talking about, though, before that, that video came down, that live shot, uh, you know, it began here with the reporters running out. And I, I just find that fascinating. Again, Libby, as you know, absolutely no cell phones allowed inside, not just the courtroom, but the courthouse in its entirety. So you had to leave every communication device possible out here. Uh, throughout the whole day. And most of those reporters went in around 9 o'clock this morning. Uh, and they had to literally run out, almost like those old uh, photos you see of reporters running to the pay phones, uh, you know, after a court case. They had to run out here to start telling uh, the journalists gathered out here what exactly happened inside. And at the same exact time, former President Trump jumped into his motorcade and began to leave. Also interesting that you point out, again, he normally does travel in a much smaller motorcade now that he's former president, but yes, this one does resemble what you're used to seeing in D.C. Uh, when, the, when the sitting president uh, is moving around town. Um, out here, last thing I just tell you is that it is still hot, and what I mean by that is not just the temperatures, but, but folks are hot. They are still yelling at us. They're yelling at uh, pro-Trump supporters are yelling at the anti-Trump
Trump protesters, and uh, it's definitely uh, a little bit tense. But I want to stress, we have not seen any, you know, dramatic violence today. I've seen a little bit of shoving, a little bit of "Don't touch me," um, but, but you know, and a lot of yelling, but not much uh, or no violence actually. And again, I didn't personally see what you guys were watching when that guy jumped in front of the motorcade and was detained. Uh, but that, you know, he has been, as I mentioned earlier, he's been, you know, mixing it up throughout the day. Libby? Uh, thanks, Rich. You know, there is some irony, I guess, to seeing the guy dressed in, like, fake prison garb in the black and white outfit heading away in police custody now because he jumped in front of that motorcade, and that's part of that safety zone that they need to have for Donald Trump. I want to share that our colleague Dylan Wells uh, reports that as Trump's motorcade left the courthouse, supporters were chanting four more years and we want Trump. And as Trump passed by, he could be seen putting two thumbs up through the car window. You can see that motorcade there going back through Miami. Uh, James, um, the day is done for Donald Trump, but we're just now learning about exactly what he experienced inside. Uh, it's important to note that Walt Nada did not plea because he did not have local counsel. So we'll be watching to see how closely those two men's fates legally are intertwined. And there are legal, I mean, I, it, Walt Nada needs his own counsel who's representing him. It's basic legal ethics. Uh, he can't just be represented by Trump's lawyers who may care more about protecting Donald Trump than protecting Walt Nada. Uh, and th this is someone, you know, we'll, we'll see. Often Trump ends up keeping people close by paying their legal bills, uh, by picking their lawyers. We saw a lot of that uh, during the January 6th uh, committee hearing. Uh, and, you know, we haven't heard from Walt Nada like we have from Trump. Trump has sort of said he's this young guy who's being mistreated. Donald Trump is now going to fly to New Jersey once uh, he, uh, you know, is now finished at court, and he will speak uh, to the uh, public tonight and have a fundraiser at his golf club in New Jersey. Let's head back to Tolu Olorunipa, White House Bureau Chief. Tolu, I'm so sorry to interrupt as we saw the motorcade leaving the courthouse. Uh, talk to us about just how President Biden and the White House plans to deal with this now moving forward, because he now needs to deal with the public perception of what this Jack Smith special counsel investigation and now prosecution will mean. Um, but then that's separate potentially from candidate Joe Biden and how he has to deal with this. That's exactly right. You have the well-planned strategy of the White House, which is to not touch this with a 10-foot pole, not talk about it, not publicly weigh in on this in any way. But then you have not only the president's campaign for re-election, but the president himself, who has long been someone who goes off script and speaks his mind and talks about things that are in the news uh, just like anyone else. And that's why he's been known as sort of your average everyday kind of person uh, while he was in the, in the Senate. And he was known for, you know, being able to give quotes on a number of different issues, even when some of his colleagues did not want to give in uh, and then speak about some controversial issues. Now, as president, he's had to be a little bit more circumspect, but uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we do hear him weigh in at some point in some way to say what he thinks. Uh, now, uh, the White House and the president also have to deal with the fact that, uh, you know, a number of his opponents are saying that the indictment of President Trump and the prosecution of President Trump is a sign of a, a two-tiered system of justice in which President Biden and his family do not get prosecuted for their alleged misbehavior while President Trump gets uh, indicted for what he has done. You have a case with uh, President Biden having taken some documents from the White House from his time as the vice president that were deemed classified. Very different cases, but uh, because they're both happening at the same time, because special counsels are uh, operating on both of those cases, you have a lot of Republicans that are saying President Biden is getting treated uh, with kid gloves or with a, a different sense of justice. And he's going to have to probably address that at some point uh, over the next several months. And so even as he wants to be removed from this and not engage in this, and the White House wants to say that they're not involved, at some point they're going to have to comment, they're going to have to engage with this subject matter, just because that is uh, where this all seems to be heading uh, as we get closer and closer to a presidential election next year. Yeah, how do, do the White House advisors, so President Biden's advisors, view or think about past statements he's made when he has chosen to weigh in um, on 
legal proceedings or on Trump's situation or Trump's judgment. How are they sort of thinking about that and weighing how to uh, counsel him going forward? They're in a bit of a wait and see mode. Uh, they have their strategy, which is to say the Department of Justice is independent. President Biden learned about these charges at the same time everyone else did. He wasn't briefed ahead of time. He wasn't involved in making the decision of whether or not whether or not to charge his uh, political opponent and his predecessor, President former President Trump. And so that's their strategy. But they are in wait and see mode. They're also going to wait and see to see how President Biden himself engages with this subject matter after he has asked about it over and over and over again in uh, various settings where he's in, in, in communication with reporters. They know he's going to be asked about this. They know he can stick to the company line uh, for a, a while and say he had nothing to do with it and and he has no thoughts about it. Or he doesn't want to talk about it. But at some point, as we've seen over the past several months and as we've seen over you know, Biden's long career in Washington, sometimes he goes off script and, and just speaks his mind. And obviously, he's going to have thoughts about the fact that the person who was in the presidency before he became, became president is now being charged for the first time. It's a moment of history. Uh, he knows what it means to have access to classified documents. He knows what it means to potentially take those documents and what it would mean to not have those documents turned over to the government. And so he's in a unique position to comment and to have opinions about this because he knows what it means to be president and all of the responsibilities that come along with that. So I wouldn't be surprised if even as he is advised by his advisors not to comment on this, he advised, he speaks out on it in some way and gives us a sense of his unique perspective and unique opinion on the fact that President Trump has been indicted and is facing these charges. Tolu Ulrinipa, our White House bureau chief and recent Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, Tolu, thank you so much for your reporting today. Rhonda, as we watch this motorcade make its way through Florida, uh, the courtroom part of the day is done. Now Trump goes on to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. He goes to give uh, a speech tonight. Uh, he also has a fundraiser. So what does this day mean in, uh, in its totality for Donald Trump? Well, I think uh, the only playbook or template that we know of is to apply what he did the day that... Uh, okay, let's, I guess we're hearing now this is Versailles, the Cuban sandwich shop ah, in Miami. Yes. Sorry, Rhonda. This, this Go ahead, is, James. This yeah. is like the yeah. meeting it is, place. Yes. This, is... Uh, this is what's called an OTR in uh, kind of politician parlance. Mm -hmm. uh, Trump, uh, this is an un unscheduled, unannounced stop at like... The, the Cuban place. This is the center of, you know, Cayo Joe. It's yeah. a Cuban community, yeah. Little Havana. This is a, a big deal when you, you stop there. <laughs> it's, a, it's a place I've gone with many politicians over the years covering mm -hmm. Mitt Romney, uh, Rick Santorum. Uh, yeah. it, uh, you know, but it also is, uh, you know, Cuba, Little Cuba, Little Havana, very uh, conservative community. Uh, and this might fit with what we've heard from Trump campaign officials as a part of a broader strategy to say, you know, the the government going after the predecessor is something that you would see in Cuba or you would see in a socialist South American mm -hmm. country. We heard kind of Trump telegraph that message over the weekend in Georgia and North Carolina. Uh, it, it's also possible that, uh, you know, as you can see, there are a bunch there of people. He there he is. There's Tr Donald Trump. The fact that people are standing there with Trump flags waving shows that maybe some mm -hmm. people did get a, a heads up, mm -hmm. uh, kind of a tip off. And so maybe there are going to be loyalists here. Uh, and this is a, a chance for Trump to look like he's among the people. Uh, and also, honestly, to play to the Miami jury pool. I was just going to say that, that, that that's important, too, because there are a lot of uh, folks who will be in a potential jury pool who are maybe Cuban-American. Uh, that demographic is a large one uh, in Miami. Uh, and he's also presenting a picture that, and there's Will there's Walmata, <laughs> uh, they're, they're presenting a, a picture of confidence that, you know, they just had this on their to-do list earlier today and, and they want to stop at an iconic place. It's a very populist move by Trump. I don't know if we can hear what he's saying. Are they praying for him? Father, we thank you that if you are with us, you can be against us. 
And Father, we thank you that you've given us President Trump to stand against the wave that's coming against our nation. Father, as Cuban Americans, we declare communism will not come to our shores. Father, we thank you that you've anointed him and called him for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Padre, vengo a decir a pedirte por este varón, para un cantado nai, el ojeno me lejo lam, bendito tú eres Padre, creador del universo. Te pido que un cantado este hombre con toda fortaleza, disipando toda tiniebla, todo. So we're now having a prayer in Hebrew. We have a Christian prayer. Dale fortaleza a tu mano. Dale fortaleza. Dale ese espíritu de poder y dominio propio en el nombre de Jesús. Lo declaramos libre de toda maldición. As we heard in that uh, Christian prayer, Rhonda. Uh, invoking Cuba, invoking Cuban Americans, and invoking communism. Yeah, which is something we heard from Trump himself on Saturday when he said, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, uh, the communists will win unless we stop them. And he was calling, uh, you know, Jack Smith, Letitia James, all those involved in legal probes uh, on the side of uh, Marxists and communists. Th those are Trump's words. Uh, and so this is playing into a narrative, uh, probably an emerging narrative we're seeing from Trump right now. Um, and, and to James's point about this doesn't look like a random stop. Uh, you would have had the Secret Service likely to do an advanced sweep uh, before he came in. It looks like people gathered there knowing he was coming. I mean, it isn't quite lunchtime. Maybe this is the dinner part. I don't know. But uh, I don't know if this would be the time that this restaurant would be this full. It's important to talk about how he's trying to weaponize the Department of Justice, this investigation, and Jack Smith. And I mean, I should, Jack Smith is not a communist. He, right. He's not. Uh, He's an independent. <laughs> He's someone who has a track record, uh, James, of being. Um, all right, Donald Trump promising food for everyone. We'll see who pays that bill. Uh, James, let's talk about Jack Smith and how sort of bogus this line of the communism claim is. I mean, this is the, Merrick Garland very carefully, uh, uh, himself not a communist, appointed this independent special prosecutor who gave up this job prosecuting Kosovo war criminals in The Hague to come back, trying to do everything by the book, trying to be above board, knowing that they were going to get you know, accused of, of weaponizing the government. Uh, and uh, uh, sort of Trump gets to run this play. This is a political play. This is also, you know, by the way, Ron DeSantis's political backyard where he's doing this uh, in Florida. Uh, Trump, you know, claimed Florida residence a few years ago, but he's trying to present himself as the presumptive Republican nominee, and he's trying to present this independent indictment from a special counsel as as somehow Joe Biden and Mayor Garland coming after him directly. Uh, and uh, if he can convince Republican voters that that's the case, if he can get people to buy this, then he, from the political part of this, will endure. It sounds like they're singing happy birthday. We'll point out that Donald Trump's birthday is tomorrow, <laughs> June 14th. So the narrative that Trump is trying to stake ground on is that this is an unfair persecution, not just a prosecution, but a persecution, something that would be done in a communist country without rule of law and without a system of justice. Let's go over the facts and what's happening here. The special counsel was put in place to give that arm's length so that Joe Biden could not interfere, that Merrick Garland could not interfere, that the special counsel not just wouldn't have interference, but there'd be no appearance of interference, even if that interference never would have happened in the first place. And so the special counsel has been, let's listen to D Donald Trump now. We have a country that's got no borders. We have a country that's got nothing but problems. We're a nation in decline. And then they do this stuff. And you see where the people are. We love the people. And you see where they are. You see the crowds and everything else. We have a country that is in decline like never before. And we can't let it happen. I'm going to make a little uh, speech tonight. OK, Donald Trump and talking about his speech tonight and giving really what already are talking points, really his campaign platform for the next election. I want to get back, though, to this claim that this is a rigged system and that this is communism happening. OK, so we've got Jack Smith doing this investigation. And as we heard today, this was a by the book standard court appearance which followed the letter of the law. Donald Trump is innocent until proven guilty, but the indictment lays out 37 charges against him because of his choices over mishandling of documents. And, and, and I'll also add when it comes to the special counsel and how Merrick Garland wanted a particular uh, investigator and prosecutor over this case, 
in the documents case with uh, President Biden, there is also another uh, special counsel on that. So it's applying the same standard to uh, a case of classified documents on the Biden side as well. So, you know, we're probably going to hear more claims from Trump and his supporters that this is uh, some sort of corruption, but the law is also applying to the Biden case as well. And we have also talked about a lot, but we should always keep talking about it, that the facts with this indictment is that Trump was aware that he had these sensitive documents. He did not comply with the subpoena when asked to return them and, and, and obstructed justice. So those are the facts of this indictment uh, and why they differ from the other ones. And no, to your point, Libby, Trump's not responding substantively to the charges. He's That's not right. saying... The, the photographs are fake, the, my lawyer's uh, message is fake. Uh, this, he's, he's just saying this is persecution. And you know, he's, he repeated enough, he hopes that people will sort of accept it, his base will accept this. Uh, and one of the other things that he, I believe, said there, which he says often, is that this isn't an attack on me, and it's an attack on you. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is sort of the, the populist playbook uh, that, uh, that, you know, frankly, this is, harder for him to argue than uh, when it was in New York with Alvin Bragg, who is an elected prosecutor in Manhattan, an area where he got less than 10 percent of the vote. This is a, a career prosecutor in federal court, uh, you know, who, who brought these charges, not a, you know, kind of an elected official who's coming after him. To be clear, the point of a stop like this is essentially to have a campaign moment, to have that photo op, to be shown being prayed over, mm -hmm. um, but also perhaps as a morale booster for yeah. Donald Trump, because let's not minimize what he just experienced. For the first time ever in American history, a former president of the United States was booked in a federal building. He had his first appearance before uh, a court magistrate who has control over the room. This is not a room that Donald Trump can control, and his hands will soon be in the fate of a judge, ultimately a jury. And ultimately, he will have to face these 37 federal counts in addition to the counts he's facing in New York. Mm -hmm. Federal charges for someone who ran the federal government. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's stunning. I, I, I don't know how he is feeling. We don't know the mind of Donald Trump. But to be in a position where he can't control the situation, he is being told what to do, uh, I'm, I'm sure did not sit well with him based on what we know from our reporting of his entire administration. He was someone who, you know, fired or let go people who uh, seemed disloyal to him. So he's someone that appears to want to always be in control of the situation, which may be why that stop occurred, too to sort of bring the narrative back around to him that this is a persecution also to show that you know perhaps he feels he's confident we also saw the other person named as a co-conspirator in the indictment Walt Nada there he, there he did not seem as if someone who might turn on uh, the former president he's he's right by his side so this was also a show to the American people because you know we couldn't see what went on in that that room we don't even have pictures like we did from the last indictment uh, in Manhattan. Uh, so we, a lot of people are only able to see what Trump is telling people uh, of what happened. And I'm sure we'll hear more tonight from his view of what happened. Your point about morale boosters is a really good one. His wife, Melania Trump, did not fly down with him. Uh, she stayed in New York City. She didn't appear with him at the uh, Manhattan arraignment either. You know, th th this is a morale boost. It's a, you know, Trump is someone who is very uh, has shown himself to need that af affirmation, uh, the adulation. Uh, a lot of politicians do, Trump especially, and he obviously just got that at Versailles. Yeah. Uh, we will continue to watch how all of this unfolds. Our Washington Post reporters who were present in the federal courthouse will be filing their dispatches and sharing their insights as to what they witnessed and giving us that view into what happened today. It was a first for American history. A former president was booked in a federal building. He appeared before a federal magistrate. And that man, Donald Trump, faces 37 counts over classified documents, including conspiracy to obstruct justice, also making false statements. We're going to leave it there for our broadcast today, so I'd like to give a special thanks to Rhonda and James and all of our colleagues around the Washington Post newsroom. We'll continue to monitor this story as our reporters break news. For the latest, follow our coverage at WashingtonPost.com. That wraps up this special report for today. I'm Libby Casey. Take care.
The Washington Post newsroom delivers breaking events around the world as they happen. Unrivaled reporting from the journalists you've come to trust to get the facts fast and meet the challenges of today head on. Get the news that matters most with a special offer by visiting WashingtonPost.com slash watch. Subscribing unlocks instant access, bringing you the Post's award-winning coverage anytime, anyplace, because democracy dies in darkness.